I'm going to skip the first few paragraphs, and which are just throat clearing, and begin in the middle of page two. In this lecture, I'll take up the distinction between morality and prudence. This distinction is traditionally drawn by opposing unconditional and categorical obligations to conditional and hypothetical ones. Obviously, pragmatists are going to have doubts about the suggestion that anything is unconditional, for they doubt that anything is or could be non-relational. So they need to reinterpret the distinctions between morality and prudence, morality and expediency, and morality and self-interest in ways which dispense with the notion of unconditional obligation. Dewey suggested that we reconstruct the distinction between prudence and morality in terms of the distinction between routine and non-routine social relationships. He saw prudence as a member of the same family of concepts as habit and custom. All three words describe familiar and relatively uncontroversial ways in which individuals and groups adjust to the stresses and strains of their non-human and human environments. It's obviously prudent both to keep an eye out for poisonous snakes in the grass and to trust strangers less than members of one's family. Prudence, expediency, and efficiency are all terms which describe such routine, uncontroversial adjustments to circumstance. Morality and law, on the other hand, begin when controversy arises. We invent both when we can no longer just do what comes naturally, when routine is no longer good enough, when habit and custom no longer suffice. These will no longer suffice when the individual's needs begin to clash with those of her family or her families with those of her neighbors, or when economic strain begins to split her community into warring classes, or when that community must come to terms with an alien community. On Dewey's account, the prudence morality distinction is, like that between custom and law, a distinction of degree, the degree of need for conscious deliberation and explicit formulation of precepts, rather than a distinction of kind. There's no distinction of kind for Dewey, for pragmatists like Dewey, between what's useful and what's right. For as Dewey said, quote, right is only an abstract name for the multitude of concrete demands in action which others impress upon us and of which we are obliged, if we would live, to take some account. The utilitarians were right when they coalesced the moral and the useful, but they were wrong insofar as they tried to reduce simply to getting pleasure and avoiding pain. Dewey agrees with Aristotle, he argues at great length against the utilitarians, that human happiness cannot be reduced to the accumulation of pleasure. From Kant's point of view, however, Aristotle, Mill, and Dewey are equally blind to the true nature of morality. To identify moral obligation with the need to adjust one's behavior to the needs of other human beings is for Kantians either vicious or simple-minded. Dewey seems to Kantians to have confused duty with self-interest, the intrinsic authority of the moral law with the banasic need to bargain with opponents whom one cannot overcome. Dewey was well aware of this Kantian sort of criticism. Here's one of the passages in which he attempted to answer it. Quote, morals, it is said, imply the subordination of fact to ideal consideration, while the view presented, Dewey's view, makes morals secondary to bare fact, which is equal to depriving them of dignity and jurisdiction. The criticism rests upon a false separation. It argues, in effect, that either ideal standards antecede customs and confer their moral quality upon them, or that, in being subsequent to customs and evolved from them, they are mere accidental byproducts. But how does it stand with language? Language grew out of unintelligent babblings, instinctive motions called gestures, and the pressure of circumstance. But nevertheless, language, once called into existence, is language and operates as language. The point of Dewey's analogy between language and morality is that there was no decisive moment at which language stopped being a series of reactions to the behavior of other humans and started to represent reality. Similarly, there was no point at which practical reasoning stopped being prudential and became specifically moral, no point at which it stopped being merely useful and started being genuinely authoritative. Dewey's reply to those who, like Kant, think of morality as stemming from a specifically human faculty called reason and of prudence as something shared with the brutes is that the only thing that's specifically human is language, but the history of language is a seamless story of gradually increasing complexity. 
the story of how we got from Neanderthal grunts and nudges to German philosophical treatises is no more discontinuous than the story of how we got from the amoebae to the anthropoids. The two stories are parts of one larger story. From an evolutionary point of view, there's no difference between the grunts and the treatises, save complexity. Yet the difference between the language using and the mute animals, and the difference between cultures which don't engage in conscious collective moral deliberation and cultures which do, are as important and obvious as ever, even though they are differences of degree. On Dewey's view, philosophers who have sharply distinguished reason from experience or morality from prudence have tried to turn an important difference of degree into a difference of metaphysical kind. They have thereby constructed problems for themselves which are as insoluble as they are artificial. Dewey saw Kant in his moral philosophy as taking, quote, the doctrine that the essence of reason is complete universality and hence necessity and immutability with the seriousness becoming the professor of logic. He interpreted Kant's attempt to get advice about what to do out of the mere idea of universalizability as offering not an impossible disregard of consequences, but merely a broad, impartial view of consequences. All that the categorical imperative do does, Dewey said, is, quote, to commend the habit of asking how we should be willing to be treated in a similar case. The attempt to do more, to get, quote, ready-made rules available at a moment's notice for settling any kind of moral difficulty, quote, unquote, seemed to Dewey to have been born, quote, of timidity and nourished by love of authoritative prestige. Only such a tendency to sadomasochism, Dewey thought, could have, quote, led to the idea that absence of immutably fixed and universally applicable ready-made principles is equivalent to moral chaos. So much for the standard Dewey and criticism of the Kantian way of viewing the distinction between morality and prudence. I want now to turn to another distinction, that between reason and sentiment, thinking and feeling. Doing so will let me relate Dewey's work to that of the contemporary American moral philosopher, Annette Beyer. Beyer, one of the leading feminist philosophers in the U.S., takes David Hume as her model. She praises Hume as what she calls the woman's moral philosopher because of his willingness to take sentiment, and indeed sentimentality, as central to the moral consciousness. She also praises him for, quote, de-intellectualizing and de-sanctifying the moral endeavor, presenting it as the human equivalent of various social controls in animal or insect populations. Though Bayer rarely mentions Dewey, and Dewey rarely discusses Hume's moral philosophy at any length, these three militantly anti-Kantian philosophers are on the same side of most arguments. All three share the same distrust of the notion of moral <laughs> obligation. Dewey, Bayer, and Hume might all agree with Nietzsche that the pre-Socratic Greeks were free from the timidity, the fear of having to make hard choices, which led Plato to search for immutable moral truth. All three see the temporal circumstances of human life as difficult enough without sadomasochistically adding immutable, unconditional obligations. Bayer has proposed that we substitute the notion of appropriate trust for that of obligation as our central moral concept. She has said, quote, there is no room for moral theory as something which is more philosophical and less committed than moral deliberation, and which is not simply an account of our customs and styles of justification, criticism, protest, revolt, conversion, and resolution." Close quote. In words that echo some of Dewey's, Bayer says that, quote, the villain is the rationalist law-fixated tradition in moral philosophy, a tradition which assumes that, quote, behind every moral intuition lies a universal rule. That tradition assumes that Hume's attempt to think of moral progress as a progress of sentiments fails to account for moral obligation. But on Bayer's view, as on Dewey's, there's nothing to account for. Moral obligation doesn't have a nature or source different from tradition, habit, and custom. Morality is simply a new and controversial custom. The special obligation we feel when we use the term moral is simply the special need we feel to act in a relatively unfamiliar, untried way, a way which may have unpredictable and dangerous consequences. Our sense that prudence is unheroic and morality heroic is merely the recognition that testing out the relatively untried is more dangerous, more risky than doing what comes naturally. 
Byron Dewey agreed that the central flaw in much traditional moral philosophy has been the myth of the self as non-relational, as capable of existing independently of any concern for others, as a cold psychopath needing to be constrained to take account of other people's needs. This is the picture of the self which philosophers since Plato have interpreted in terms of the division between reason and the passions, a division which Hume unfortunately perpetuated in his notorious inversion of Plato, his claim that reason is and should be the slave of the passions. Ever since Plato, the West has construed the reason-passion distinction as paralleling the distinction between the universal and the individual, as well as that between unselfish and selfish actions. The religious, Platonic, and Kantian traditions have thus saddled us with the distinction between the true self and the false self, the self which hears the call of conscience, and the self which is merely self-interested. The latter self is merely prudential and not yet moral. Byer and Dewey both argue that the notion of the self as cold, self-interested, calculating psychopaths should be set aside. If we really were such selves, the question, why should I be moral, would be forever unanswerable. Only when we masochistically picture ourselves as such selves, do we feel the need to punish ourselves by quailing before divine commands or before Kant's tribunal of pure practical reason. But if we follow the pragmatist's advice to see everything as constituted by its relations to everything else, it will be easy to detect the fallacy which Dewey described as, quote, transforming the truistic fact of acting as a self into the fiction of acting always for self. We shall commit this fallacy and continue to think of the self as a psychopath in need of restraint as long as we accept what Dewey called, quote, the belief in the fixity and simplicity of the self. Dewey associated this belief with, quote, the theologian's dogma of the unity and ready-made completeness of the soul, but he might equally well have associated it with the argument of Plato's Phaedo or with Kant's doctrine that the moral self is a non-empirical self. If we put such notions of unity and ready-made completeness to one side, we can say with Dewey that, quote, selfhood, except in so far as it has encased itself in a shell of routine, is in process of making, and that any self is capable of including within itself a number of inconsistent selves, of unharmonized dispositions, close quotes. This notion of multiple inconsistent selves is, as Donald Davidson has shown us, a good way of naturalizing and demystifying the Freudian notion of the unconscious. But the most important link between Freud and Dewey is the one which Bayer emphasizes, the role of the family, and in particular, of maternal love, in creating non-psychopaths, human selves who find concern for other human beings entirely natural. Bayer says, in words which Dewey might have written, that, quote, the secular equivalent of faith in God is faith in the human community and its evolving procedures in the prospects for many-handed cognitive ambitions and moral hopes, close quotes. But she sees that faith is rooted in the faith most of us have in our parents and siblings. The trust which holds a family together is Byers' model for the secular faith which may hold together modern post-traditional societies. Freud helped us see that we get psychopaths, people whose self-conception involves no relations to others, only when parental love and the trust which such love creates in the child are absent. To see the point which Bayer wants us to appreciate, consider the question, do I have a moral obligation to my mother, to my wife, to my children? Morality and obligation seem inapposite terms. For doing what one is obliged to do contrasts with doing what comes naturally, and for most people, responding to the needs of family members is the most natural thing in the world. Such responses come naturally because most of us define ourselves, at least in part, by our relations to members of our family. Our needs and theirs largely overlap. We are not happy if they are not. We would not wish to be well fed while our children go hungry. That would be unnatural. Would it also be immoral? It's a bit strange to say so. One would only employ this term if one, one encountered a parent who was also a pathological legalist, a father or mother whose sense of self has nothing to do with her or his children, the sort of person envisaged by decision theory, someone whose identity is constituted by preference rankings rather than by fellow feeling. 
By contrast, I may feel a specifically moral obligation to deprive both my children and myself of a portion of the available food because there are starving people outside our door. The word moral is appropriate here because the demand is less natural than the demand that I feed my children. It's less lo closely connected with my sense of who I am. But the desire to feed the hungry stranger may of course become as tightly woven into my self-conception as the desire to feed my family. Moral development in the individual and moral progress in the human species as a whole is a matter of remaking human selves so as to enlarge the variety of the relationships which constitute those selves. The ideal limit of this process of enlargement is the self envisaged by Christian and Buddhist accounts of sainthood, an ideal self to whom the hunger or suffering of any human being, even perhaps that of any other animal, is intensely painful. Should this progress ever be completed, the term morality would drop out of the language for there would no longer be any way nor any need to contrast doing what comes naturally with doing what is moral. We should all have what Kant called a holy will. The term moral obligation becomes increasingly less appropriate to the, idea, to the degree to which we identify our, with those whom we help, the degree to which we mention them when telling ourselves stories about who we are, the degree to which their story is also our story. It comes fairly naturally to share what one has with an old friend or a near neighbor or a close business associate who has been left destitute by a sudden disaster. It comes less naturally to share with a casual acquaintance or a complete stranger who is in the same unfortunate situation. In a world in which hunger is common, it does not come naturally to take food from one's children's mouths in order to feed a hungry stranger and her children. But if the stranger and her children are on your doorstep, you may well feel obliged to do just that. The term moral and obligation become even more appropriate when it's a matter of depriving your children of something they want in order to send money to the victims of a famine in a country you've never seen, to people whom you might well feel, feel you might well find repellent if you ever encountered them, people whom you might not want as friends, might not want your children to marry, people whose only claim on your attention is that you have been told that they are hungry. But Christianity taught the West to look forward to a world in which there are no such people, a world in which all men and women are brothers and sisters. In that world, there would never be any occasion to speak of obligation. When moral philosophers in the Kantian tradition put sentiment on a par with prejudice and tell us that from a strictly moral point of view, there is no difference between one's own hungry child and a randomly selected hungry child on the other side of the world, they're contrasting this so-called moral point of view with a point of view they call mere self-interest. The idea behind this way of speaking is that morality and obligation starts where self-interest stops. The problem with this way of speaking, Dewey insisted, is that the boundaries of the self are fuzzy and flexible. So philosophers in this tradition try to obscure this fuzziness by defining, defining those boundaries. They do so by saying that the self is constituted by a preference ranking, one which divides people up according to whom one would prefer to be fed first, for example. Then they either contrast moral obligation with preference or else subjectivize feelings of moral obligation by taking them as just further preferences. There are difficulties with both of these alternatives. If you contrast moral obligation with preference, you have trouble with the question of moral motivation. What sense does it make, after all, to say that a person acts against her own preferences? On the other hand, if you no longer distinguish between morality and self-interest and say that what we call morality is simply the self-interest of those who have been acculturated in a certain way, then you will be accused of emotivism, of having failed to appreciate Kant's distinction between dignity and value. One way leads to the question Plato tried to answer, why should I be moral? The other way leads to the question, is there any difference between a preference for feeding hungry strangers over letting them starve and a preference for vanilla over chocolate ice cream? More generally, one way seems to lead to a dualistic metaphysics to splitting the universe, to splitting the human self and possibly the universe as a whole into higher and lower segments. The other seems to lead to a wholesale abnegation of our aspirations to something higher than mere animality. 
Pragmatists are often accused of just such an abnegation. They are lumped with reductionists, behaviorists, sensualists, nihilists, and other dubious characters. I think that the pragmatist's best defense against this sort of charge is to say that she too has a conception of our difference from the animals, but hers doesn't involve a sharp difference, a difference between the finite and the infinite of the sort illustrated by Kant's distinction between dignity and value, between the unconditioned and the condition, the non-relational and the relational. Rather, the pragmatist sees our difference as a much greater degree of flexibility, in particular, a much greater flexibility in the boundaries of selfhood in the sheer quantity of relationships which, when, which can go to constitute a human self. She sees the ideal of human brotherhood and sisterhood not as the imposition of something non-empirical on the empirical, nor of something non-natural on the natural, but as the culmination of a process of adjustment which is also a process of remaking the human species. From this point of view, moral progress is not a matter of an increase of rationality, a gradual diminution of the influence of prejudice and superstition permitting us to see our moral duty more clearly. Nor is it what do we call an increase of intelligence, increasing skill at inventing courses of action which simultaneously satisfy many conflicting demands. People can be very intelligent in this sense without having wide sympathies. It's neither irrational or unintelligent to draw the limits of one's moral community at a national or racial or gender border. But it's undesirable, morally undesirable. So it's best to think of moral progress as a matter of increasing sensitivity, increasing responsiveness to the needs of a larger and larger variety of people and things. Just as the pragmatist sees scientific progress not as the gradual attenuation of a veil of appearance which hides the intrinsic nature of reality from us, but as the increasing ability to respond to the concerns of ever larger groups of people, especially the people who carry out ever more acute observations and perform ever more refined experiments, so they see moral progress as a matter of being able to respond to the needs of ever more inclusive groups of people. I want to pursue this analogy between science and morals a bit further. I said in earlier lectures that pragmatists don't think of scientific or any other inquiry as aimed at truth, but rather at better justificatory ability. Better ability to deal with doubts about what we're saying, either by shoring up what we previously said, or by deciding to say something slightly different. The trouble with aiming at truth is that you wouldn't know it when you'd reached it, even if you did in fact reach it. But you can, can aim at assuaging ever more doubt. Analogously, you can't aim at doing what is right because you'll never know whether you've hit the mark. Long after you're dead, better informed and more sophisticated people may judge your action to have been a tragic mistake, just as they may judge your scientific beliefs to have presupposed an obsolete cosmology. But you can aim at ever more sensitivity to pain, and ever greater satisfaction of ever more various needs. Pragmatists think the, aim, the idea of something non-human luring us human beings on should be replaced with the idea of getting more and more human beings into our community, of taking the needs and interests and views of more and more diverse human beings into account. Justificatory ability is, on the pragmatist view, its own reward. There's no need to worry about whether we will be rewarded with a sort of immaterial metal labeled truth or moral goodness. The idea of a God's eye view to which science continually approximates is of a piece with the idea of the moral law to which social custom in periods of moral progress continually approximates. The ideas of discovering the intrinsic nature of physical reality and of clarifying our unconditional moral obligations are equally distasteful to pragmatists because both presuppose the existence of something non-rational, something exempt from the vicissitudes of time and history, something unaffected by changing human interests and needs. Both ideas are to be replaced, pragmatists think, by metaphors of width rather than of height or depth. Scientific progress is a matter of integrating more and more data into a coherent web of belief Data from microscopes and telescopes with data obtained by the naked eye, data forced into the open by experiment with data which always has been lying about. It's not a matter of penetrating appearance until one comes upon reality. 
and moral, philosophy, moral progress is a matter of wider and wider sympathy rather than a matter of rising above the sentimental to the rational. Nor is it a matter of appealing from lower and corrupt local courts to a higher court which administers an ahistorical, non-local, transcultural moral law. This switch from metaphors of vertical distance to metaphors of horizontal extent ties in with the pragmatist's insistence on replacing traditional distinctions of kind with distinctions in degree of complexity. Pragmatists substitute the idea of a maximally efficient explanation of a maximally wide range of data for that of the theory which cuts reality at the joints. They substitute the idea of a maximally warm, sensitive, and sympathetic human being for the Kantian idea of a good will. But though maximality cannot be aimed at, you can aim at explaining more data or being concerned about more people. You can't aim at being at the end of inquiry in either physics or ethics. That would be like aiming at being at the end of biological evolution, at being not merely the latest heir of all the ages, but the being in which the ages were destined to culminate. Analogously, you can't aim at moral perfection, but you can aim at taking more people's needs into account than you did previously. So far in this lecture, I've been suggesting in rather general terms why the pragmatist would like to get rid of the notion of unconditional moral obligation. In the hope of greater concreteness and vividness, I turn now to another example of unconditionality, the notion of unconditional human rights. Such rights are said to form the fixed boundaries of political and moral deliberation. In American jurisprudence, as it's interpreted, for example, by Ronald Dworkin, rights trump every consideration of social expediency and efficiency. In much political discussion, it is taken for granted that the rights which the U.S. courts have interpreted the U.S. Constitution to bestow and the universal human rights enumerated in the Helsinki Declaration are beyond discussion. They are the unmoved movers of contemporary politics. From a pragmatist point of view, the notion of inalienable human rights is no better and no worse a slogan than that of obedience to the will of God. Either slogan, when invoked as an unmoved mover, is simply a way of saying that our spade is turned, that we have exhausted our argumentative resources. Talk of the will of God or the rights of man, like talk of the honor of the family or the fatherland in danger, are not suitable targets of philosophical analysis and criticism. It's fruitless to look behind them. None of these notions should be analyzed, for they're all ways of saying, here I stand, I can do no other. They are not reasons for action so much as announcements that one has thought the issue through and come to a decision. Traditional philosophy, the kind which sees morals as resting on metaphysics, presses such notions too hard when it asks questions like, but is there a God? Do human beings really have these rights? Such questions presuppose that moral progress is at least in part a matter of increasing moral knowledge, knowledge about something independent of our social practices, something like the will of God or the underlying nature of humanity. This metaphysical suggestion is vulnerable to Nietzschean suggestions that both God and human rights are superstitions, contrivances put forward by the weak to protect themselves against the strong. Whereas metaphysicians reply to Nietzsche by asserting that there is a rational basis for belief in God or in human rights, pragmatists replied that there is nothing wrong with contrivances. The pragmatists can cheerfully agree with Nietzsche that the idea of human brotherhood would only have occurred to the weak, to the people being shoved around by the brave, strong, happy warriors whom Nietzsche idolizes. But for pragmatists, this fact no more counts against the idea of human rights than Socrates' ugliness counted against his account of the nature of love, or than Freud's private little neuroses count against his account of love, or than Newton's theological and alchemical concerns count against his mechanics, or than Heidegger's bad moral character counts against his philosophical achievement. Once you drop the distinction between reason and passion, you will no longer discriminate against a good idea because of its dubious origins. You will classify ideas according to their relative utility rather than by their sources. Pragmatists think that the quarrel between rationalist metaphysicians and Nietzsche is without interest. They grant to Nietzsche that reference to human rights is merely a convenient way of summarizing certain aspects of our real or purported practices. 
analogously to say that the intrinsic nature of reality consists of atoms in the void, is for a pragmatist a way of saying that our most successful scientific explanations interpret macrostructural change as a result of microstructural change. To say that God wills us to welcome the stranger within our gates is to say that hospitality is one of the virtues upon which our community prides itself. To say that respect for human rights demanded our intervention to save the Jews from the Nazis or the Bosnian Muslims from the Serbs is to, is to say that a failure to intervene would make us uncomfortable with ourselves in the way in which knowledge that our children or our neighbors are hungry while we have plenty on the table makes us unable to continue eating. To speak of human rights is to explain our actions by identifying ourselves with a community of like-minded persons, those who find it natural to act in a certain way. Claims of the sort I've just made, claims which have the form to say such and such is to say so and so, are often interpreted in terms of the reality appearance distinction. Metaphysically inclined thinkers obsessed by the distinction between knowledge and opinion, or between reason and passion, interpret such claims as irrationalist and emotivist. But pragmatists don't intend these as claims about what's really going on, claims that what appeared to be a fact is actually a value, or what appeared to be a cognition is actually an emotion. Rather, these claims are practical recommendations about what to talk about, suggestions about the terms in which controversy on moral questions is best conducted. On the subject of atoms, the pragmatist thinks we should not debate the issue of whether unobservable microstructure is a reality or just a convenient fiction. On the subject of human rights, the pragmatist thinks that we should not debate whether human rights have been there all the time, even when nobody recognized them, or are just the social construction of a civilization influenced by Christian doctrines of the brotherhood of man and by the ideals of the French Revolution. In one sense of the term social construction, hum uh, in one sense of the term social construction, human rights are social constructions, but then so are neutrinos and giraffes. In that sense, to be a social construction is simply to be the intentional object of a certain set of sentences, sentences used in some societies and not in others. All that it takes to be an object is to be talked about in a reasonably coherent way. But not everybody needs to talk in all ways, nor therefore about all objects. Once we give up the idea that the point of discourse is to represent reality accurately, we shall have no interest in distinguishing social constructs from other things. We'll confine ourselves to debating the utility of alternative social constructs. The only other sense of social construction that I can think of is the one I referred to earlier, the sense in which bank accounts are social constructions but giraffes aren't. And here the criterion is simply causal. The causal factors which produced giraffes did not include human societies. Those which produced bank accounts did. This sense has no application to the question about human rights, for even the most fervent moral realist has no causal story to tell about how these rights came into being. To debate the utility of the set of social constructs we call human rights is to debate the question of whether the language games played by inclusivist societies are better than those played by exclusivist societies. There's no way to pass judgment on those language games without passing judgment on the societies as a whole, as wholes. So instead of debating the ontological status of human rights, we should debate the question of whether communities which encourage tolerance of harmless deviants or treat pre deviants previously thought of as harmful as, har as harmless, should be preferred to those communities whose social cohesion depends on conformity, on keeping outsiders at a distance, and uh, on eliminating people who try to corrupt the youth. The best single mark of our progress toward a full-fledged human rights culture may be the extent to which we stop interfering with our children's marriage plans because of the national origin, the religion, the race, or the wealth of the intended partner, or because the marriage will be homosexual rather than heterosexual. Those who wish to supply rational philosophical foundations for a human rights culture say that what human beings have in common outweighs such adventitious factors as race and religion. But they have trouble spelling out what this commonality consists in. It's not enough to say that we all share a common susceptibility to pain, for there's nothing distinctively human about pain. If pain were all that mattered, it would be as important to protect the rabbits from the foxes as to protect the Jews from the Nazis. 
If one accepts a naturalistic Darwinian account of human origins, it's not helpful to say that we all have reason in common, for in this account to be rational is simply to be able to use language. But there are many languages, and most of them are exclusionist. The language of human rights is no more or less characteristic of our species than languages which insist on racial or religious purity. Pragmatists suggest that we simply give up the philosophical search for commonality. They think that moral progress might be accelerated if we focused instead on our ability to make the particular little things that divide us seem unimportant, not by comparing them with the one big thing that unites us, but by comparing them with other little things. We pragmatists think of moral progress as more like sewing together a very large, elaborate polychrome quilt than like getting a clearer vision of something true and deep. Here as elsewhere, we prefer metaphors of breadth and extent to metaphors of height and depth. Convinced that there's no subtle human essence which philosophy might grasp, we don't try to replace superficiality with depth, nor to rise above the particular to grasp the universal. Rather, we should like to minimize one difference at a time, the difference between Christians and Muslims in a particular village in Bosnia, the difference between blacks and whites in a particular town in Alabama, the difference between gays and straights in a particular Catholic congregation in Quebec. The hope is to sew such groups together with a thousand little stitches, to invoke a thousand little commonalities between their members rather than by specifying one great big commonality, their humanity. This picture of moral progress makes us resist Kant's suggestion that morality is a matter of reason and makes us sympathetic to Hume's suggestion that it's a matter of sentiment. If we were limited to these two candidates, we should side with Hume, but we would prefer to reject the choice and to set aside the old Greek faculty of psychology once and for all. We recommend dropping the distinction between two separately functioning sources of beliefs and desires Instead of working within the confines of this distinction, which constantly threatens us with the picture of a division between a true and real self and a false and apparent self, we can once again resort to the distinction with which I began my first lecture, the distinction between the present and the future. More specifically, we can see both intellectual and moral progress not as a matter of getting closer to the true or the good or the right, but as an increase in imaginative power. Imagination is the cutting edge of cultural evolution, the power which, given peace and prosperity, constantly operates so as to make the human future richer than the human past. Imagination is the source both of new scientific pictures of the physical universe and of new visions of possible communities. It's what Newton and Christ, Freud and Marx, had in common, the ability to, re to re-describe the familiar in unfamiliar terms. Such redescription was practiced by the early Christians when they explained that the distinction between Jew and Greek was not as important as it had been thought. It's being practiced by contemporary feminists whose descriptions of sexual behavior and marital arrangements seem as strange to many men, and for that matter many women, as St. Paul's indifference to traditional Judaic distinctions seemed to the scribes and the Pharisees. It is what the founding fathers of the United States attempted when they asked people to think of themselves not so much as Pennsylvania Quakers or Catholic Marylanders, but as citizens of a tolerant, pluralistic federal republic. It's being attempted by those passionate advocates of European unity who hope that their grandchildren will think of themselves as European first and French or German second. But an equally good example of such redescription is Democritus's and Lucretius's suggestion so we try thinking of the world as rebounding atoms, or Copernicus's suggestion that we try thinking of the sun as at rest. I said in an earlier lecture that pragmatism tries to substitute hope for knowledge. I hope that this lecture has helped make clear what I meant. The difference between the Greek conception of human nature and the post-Darwinian Deweyan conception is the difference between closure and openness between the security of the unchanging and the Whitmanesque and Whiteheadian romance of throwing oneself into the process of unpredictable change. This apotheosis of the future, this willingness to substitute imagination for certainty and curiosity for pride, breaks down the Greek distinction between contemplation and action. 
Dewey saw that distinction as the great incubus from which intellectual life in the West needed to escape. His pragmatism was, as Hilary Putnam has said, an insistence on the supremacy of the agent point of view. In these lectures, I've been interpreting this supremacy as the priority of the hope of inventing new ways of being human over the need for stability, security, and order. Get to be bewildered, and then the question won't bug you uh, in the way that, that it 
those resemblance. Um, so, I mean, it isn't just that you unfortunately inverts some platonic uh, 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 setting up of reason as uh, superior to the passions. Uh, Hume doesn't even understand what's in there in Plato in making this inverting gesture. Plato's, Plato finds, so far as um, uh, seeing um, what uh, it comes naturally to talk about in terms of getting things straight, reason doing its thing, as, as um, partly constituted by uh, the kind of progress of the sentiments that you and Annette Bayer uh, applaud here for, you know, making central to ethics, it's central in platonic ethics too. So, so um, I think that, that's two of your villains, but I think they just aren't really villains by the lights of your, um, you know, basic opposition to this, this um, I want to say fantasy. Um, suppose this was so. Suppose that Plato and Kant had been systematically misinterpreted by lots and lots and lots of people over the years. Uh, there would still be a very strong strain uh, in our culture for Dewey to protest against. It's the strain which says, it is the duty of philosophers to produce what yesterday you called a, you know, a rational engine that will convince any and all. Uh, it is the duty to uh, find an unwobbling pivot. It is the duty to rescue us from time and chance. Uh, and I don't think you can let Plato and Kant off the hook of pandering to this taste. I mean, anybody who writes about duty, thou sublime and awful name, uh, is pandering to what I'm calling the sadomasochism which motivates the tradition of unconditional moral obligation. Uh, anybody who writes about the difference between this world and the other world in the terms Plato did is pandering to the tastes of what Nietzsche called ascetic priests. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to pick the, the historical Plato and the historical Kant for Dewey's purposes. Maybe they've been dreadfully misunderstood. He doesn't much care. People look for this kind of, what I'm calling sadomasochism, in the texts of the history of philosophy and believe themselves to have found it in Plato and Kant, for better or for worse. Plato and Kant may have been wiser than their readers, but you know, there's still something there to protest against. <laughs> need to be so resolute as you are in, in um, discarding the very language of getting things straight. Um, uh, uh, um, seeing things as they are. I'm not sure. I could, could find an innocuous reading of these people whose, whose you know, mode of speech that, that is. Mm. I don't know. Amicus Plato said Magus Amica, the United States of America. Uh, it's, uh, in, it seems to me that um, that you can argue that regardless of what the great dead philosophers were up to, um, there's a psychological cast of mind supporting what Dewey thought of as the need for authority as opposed to the thing he called democracy, uh, which uh, is contributed to by the notion of, look, we got to get it, you know, you know, at a certain point we got to stop just, you know, bargaining, trading, you know, adjusting and so on, we got to get it right. Uh, Dewey thought that you, know, uh, you might as well go at it root and branch and see if you couldn't just get rid of the whole get it right rhetoric as a way of preventing the return of the ascetic priest, uh, the return of the sublime and awful and you know, stuff like that. Uh, I guess, I, guess I, I can't see that the, the, as it were compromise that you suggest or the you know the 
the rhetoric the middle the middle way rhetoric that you suggest of I mean you know strategic I mean I think the only argument is the strategic one which one's going to work I don't really care about whether it's fair to Plato and Kant I mean, you know it's um, it's um, I don't um, I mean there, there's you know, there, there's the ascetic priest Kant, and there's the proto-Hegelian Kant. There's the there's the Plato whom Nietzsche criticized, and the Plato of the symposium. Uh, you know, but that's sort of for us us epicures. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's talk about that. It does seem to me that there's a bit of the intermediate between your take on this and John. If, if, if we do think about Hegel as standing between uh, Dewey's take on Kant and, uh, and Kant, because Hegel certainly starts his being on uh, uh, Kant from these grounds, well, fully appreciating the, uh, the good impulse in Kant to say, uh, look, the only thing compatible with the dignity of uh, enlightened humanity is the only source of obligation compatible with that dignity is our own, is rules that we impose on ourselves. This, this um, uh, notion of autonomy that leads him to say, yes, but the reason and uh, uh, the awful and sublime duty is just us. Uh, and Hegel says, well, yeah, but it's real hard to recognize that way. Uh, but what you've left out is uh, you know, a sensible picture of uh, of us as that, a, a way in which we can recognize ourselves in that guise. Uh, you ought to tell us a story that will let us not be alienated from this thing, not see it as something over, over and above us. And to do that, you've got to see uh, reason as a way of talking about one dimension of our uh, of the social and historical process of, of our creating determinate contents for us to do our reasoning practical and theoretical with. And if, if you'll tell that story, which Kant resolutely wouldn't tell, taking over, all right, not your rules for morality, but at least the conceptual contents that you use in it. Uh, are just sort of there for Kant. And Hegel thought, well, you're, you're going to be alienated. You're not going to be able to recognize uh, reason as a guise of yourself unless you see these things as our social products. Uh, that was his recipe for uh, taking up the good side of Kant that he certainly saw was there. And that's certainly the side of Hegel that uh, Dewey, after uh, his youthful flush of enthusiasm for it, took over and said, well, that's right, but you, know, you Hegel, still met, uh, metaphysicalized this even more than it needs to be, and Darwin and uh, naturalism and so on have shown us how to, how to complete that process. Uh, so it seems to me one can acknowledge that Kant was a good guy in starting off this, starting off this process that would let us see that it's us all the way down, uh, but that the criticisms that they were made of uh, Kant's working out of it, and at least some of the criticisms that Dewey implicitly makes of Hegel's way of working it out, which I think people also misunderstood as they did uh, for Kant, are well taken criticisms. These are stages on the road that lead to, to the views that we're giving. We don't need to see just a bad guy there of this is yeah, he started it off yeah that's about the way I see it I guess that yeah I I don't I don't feel I I know Kant well enough to you know I I'm one of these American philosophy professors condemned in Europe who never teaches anything except the fundamental principles of the metaphysics of morals and gets so tired of the you know you know, the, the, the sadism, so to speak, that, uh, you know, you want never to hear it again. And all the nice bits of Kant tend to go on red. And I, I keep promising myself that some year I'll sit down and read the Opus Postumum and, you know, get a balanced view of the man. But I haven't. So, I, you know, I just 
use them as the standard whipping boy. Um, you know, Bjorn? I think it seems to me that it's not just a question of alternative strategies either, nor is it a question of being fair to them, just caring about getting the historical figure right versus um, addressing the accretions of misinterpretation. I think those, those distinctions don't um, do the kind of work that that uh, they should in, in, the, in the context of pragmatic reading of, of uh, the historical figures. Um, you know, with Nietzsche, I think it, it's important to take a run at your vocabulary from the from behind if, if you want to uh, come up with free yourself of certain kinds of compulsions and, and imagine new ways. You don't just come up with new ways when you rip the temple down and build a new one up. You do that by um, going back and seeing where the pieces come from. So it would seem to me an integral part of this kind of re-describing activity to also um, provide readings, not necessarily truer to the historical Plato or less misreading or anything like that, but for show that there are ways of reading, uh, readings that reveal and preserve in your different kinds of insights. Um, and I guess I feel this much more strongly, personally, for idiosyncratic reasons in relation to the Republic than I do when it comes to the, the three critiques. Um, but if you want to try and uh, give us ways of breaking free from the kind of oppositions that we typically call Platonism, it is a part of what would help that to go back and read Plato in a way which doesn't result in those kinds of oppositions. Uh, and that's also a way of shifting the weight or pulling the ground out from under those kinds of reconstructions. So you do genealogy along two tracks at the same time, you know, one destructive and one constructive. Of course, I'm not saying that everybody has to do everything at once, but it's not simply, I think, an empirical question, which, well, in one sense it is, I guess, which strategy will work. I, I do think that really you need to do both, or somebody needs to do the other thing. You know, you need to have people rereading the Republic, um, doing, I mean, the Gadamer's portrayal of what dialectic is about, one can perhaps um, read a little bit about the Republic as a start of something. So, I want to say, it's not just will it work, you got to do that at home. You have to reread these figures to try and preserve what you want to preserve. Yeah. I, I, I guess I think of it this way. The only interesting philosophers, the only ones who get into the canon, are ones whose interpretation is never agreed upon. You know, Wittgenstein, Aristotle, Plato, Kant, Hegel, and so on. Um, I take this to be because they're, you know, the power of their work is due to their incipient schizophrenia. That, uh, you know, they. The, the reason they write so strongly is because they never were quite sure which road of two very different and important roads to take. So I think we will always have this kind of, you know, pendulum swing in interpretations of these figures. Um, but I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know that there is any general recipe for integrating you know, the kind of attempt to revise the rhetoric of the culture that I'm talking about in these lectures with the activity of, you know, each, with each gener, the activity of capitalizing on each successive generation's ability to see that tension within the thought of the great dead philosopher still more clearly. Um, it's, um, I mean, I, I guess I think that um, we, we should just settle for the fact that, you know, Plato is the name for a, um, you know, co a, a complex of warring elements, uh, and so was Wittgenstein, and um, we pick and choose among these warring elements as we need them as time rolls along. Um, yeah. so. um, they 
maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but it seems you've said a couple of times that morality um, involves something that involves doing what we do naturally, like caring for our families and things, but it seems very strange for a pragmatist to be talking about the nature of human beings all of a sudden, as if we have a given nature. I, I don't think that I need a notion of the intrinsic nature of human beings uh, in order to have a contrast between what, you know, what they do if nobody bothers them and what they do only because, you know, people come in and, you know, rouse them up. Um, you know, when we say the Serbs and the Muslims in the villages of Bosnia you know, would have continued to live side by side naturally. You know, that's not a theory of human nature. It just means they would do what, you know, what people usually do in these situations, get along with their neighbors, and then the outside agitators came in. Uh, we would say that uh, we would still be throwing people to the lions on Saturdays in, uh, you know, large public spectacles if the Christians hadn't come along or you know some equivalent of the Christians come along and raise doubts about this practice because you know it's you know for uncounted millennia it was a natural and enjoyable way to spend Saturday afternoons um, that isn't a theory about human nature that's just you know a, a a quick reference to you know what happens if you leave people alone as they are these days you know. but in fact um, people don't, in many, many cases, care about their families. We, we, we keep hearing that people, there are all sorts of crack, people taking crack, but they don't care about their families, people who beat their children, etc. So it would seem that now we're talking about, well, do a majority of people treat their family well? Perhaps yes, but that we do need some force of something. It doesn't have to be an absolute force, to, to but we need something to make our convictions stronger, I think to say, you, you shouldn't do this. I mean, it seems to me that a pragmatist talking to Hitler would just say, look, you're not being very imaginative in what you're doing. And Hitler would say, I don't care what I'm being imaginative. I'm going to continue what I do. And the conversation is ended. This is very frustrating to somebody who, who would like to go further. It, it's exactly that sense of frustration which a pragmatist culture would not feel. Mm -hmm. That is, I think of that sense of frustration as exactly what has been loaded on us by what I think of as this sadomasochistic tradition, which I attribute to these distinguished schizophrenic philosophers. Uh, and it seems to me that we have, we have settled ourselves with a culture in which we are constantly saying, asking for something stronger to come along and stop these people. And, you know, uh, it isn't going to happen, and it would be nice if we could, you know, not, ex not expect it to happen. So you're content with saying to Hitler, you're not being imaginative, and him saying, I don't care, and that's the end. And you're saying, well, it's, well, it's, I, you know, I, it's I mean, I, unrealistic to expect anything else. How about being content with saying, you know, the thousand things you and I and anybody else would say to Hitler and having him shrug them all off? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nobody is content to be shrugged off. But not everyone has to hope that there will be something stronger around the corner that will do what we're unable to do. Yeah, well, I, I hope at the very least to make the person who refuses to do what I want him to do feel bad. <laughs> you know, good luck. <laughs> you know, uh, and, you know, um, but you know, do, don't expect the universe to be on your side in this struggle. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> well, uh, in a way, it's a little bit in the same line, because what I think uh, is what, what's missing here is a, a recognition that it's actually a very beautiful uh, thing about human beings that they do these silly things, like uh, we want to stop them, we want to do the thing. I mean, that's what makes us human. That's quite nice. Uh, if not, I mean, it would be kind of boring. and um, but. This is not enough, I think. I think, and what I'm what I'm missing uh, when I read uh, these last lectures is that, uh, well, um, I simply miss some understanding of not human nature, 
but um, some understanding of social reality. When I, when I read these, these pages, and where you speak of social practice, practices, and you speak of how we are going to make this uh, pragmatism uh, work, um, I need an understanding of, of uh, the reality as social. A reality which could be interpreted in various ways, but there have been a lot of intents in the, in the history of theory, um, proto-sociologists uh, in the Hegelian Marxian tradition, real sociologists like Durkheim, like Weber, there has been a lot of intents to understand social reality, which is far more convincing than simply saying that we want to web together uh, some few towns in Bosnia, a few towns in Alabama. Uh, it seems to me utterly impossible that that should be a program for realizing anything. I mean, that would require an army of uh, pragmatists. Uh, and uh, Whereas only one or two Weberians or Durkheimians can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, where should we get them from? I mean, how many followers do you have to send right now? <laughs> well, I, mean, an understand, I, I miss an understanding of social reality in the way that a lot of theorists have tried. That was what I tried to say yesterday, that if you, you go directly from some very convincing, from my point of view, arguments in the uh, the uh, epistemology and the theories of truth and the philosophy of mind and all these things, I find them very convincing. And then you just jump over to aesthetics and say, well, if we uh, just read ourselves as novels and we use imagination, then it'll be all be good. Uh, but then there is a re reality which is social. And that was the decisive move from Hegel. I mean, we can have some problems with reality which was human. I mean, he had this uh, dichotomy between uh, the, the aesthetics and the theoretics. He had some serious problems with, uh, with human reality as human. Uh, that doesn't make him less beautiful. Um, but I miss some understanding of social reality in this book. Oh. Weber has an understanding of social reality. Right. Um, yeah. Um, you think of you think of him as an. I mean, I, I guess I thought I think of Dewey and Weber as having exactly the same grasp of social reality. Uh, I mean, neither of them have an army, but uh, I, I, I can't. I, I mean, it seems to me you're demanding more out of a theory book than you could possibly get. Uh, you know, it's what I'm asking for is that you want you want to present this as um, well. When pragmatism comes through, it won't be a problem. These things, everything would be well, very nice. There would be no need for morality. We would all actually live together. When, that seems to be absurd. I mean, when pragmatism comes through, when people cease to speak in the way I, you know, I, surely I, I mean. You really take me as saying that you know you don't have to um, you know that you take me as saying that philosophy can take the place of politics uh, uh. no but I, I take you to deliver vocabulary for doing politics isn't that no 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 I mean uh, it's um, I mean the vocabulary for doing po let, let me come back to Dewey. I mean, Dewey had two sets of publications, the stuff that I'm, you know, paraphrasing here, and just sort of endless daily, weekly columns on, you know, tax legislation, tariff legislation, you know, insurance legislation, and so on. I mean, he did a lot of politics. Uh, he would have done exactly the same politics if he'd never gone to philosophy school, I imagine. Uh, you know, uh, he, you know, he knew a lot of philosophy. He knew, yeah, I read Plato and Cotton Hegel, and he wrote for people who read Plato, Cotton Hegel, and then he wrote for his fellow taxpayers about, you know, whom we should elect, what laws we should pass, and so on. Uh, I mean, doubtless there was a certain amount of, you know, back and forth 
but um, so he could have been a carpenter and done the same thing. That's what you're saying. No, he you know he would have had to be you know an informed, fluent writer to write his columns for the newspapers, but he wouldn't have had to know anything about philosophy. Um, I mean, you know, he 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 wrote. The, the articles, the articles that Dewey wrote about what we Americans should be doing were all, you know, similar articles were being written by dozens of other people and, you know, sort of American social democrat types uh, who weren't in the philosophy business. They were, you know, economists or journalists or something like that. Uh, and, um, you know, Dewey didn't know much about economics. The economists didn't know much about philosophy. Uh, but they all thought that their professional disciplines were making little contributions to the long-run welfare of humanity, and this was Dewey's. Uh, so, so actually, you don't have to know anything about society to know what is true about society. I mean, you can know sure. without philosophy, or without theory, you can know what is best for society. Or yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I, you know, I don't know, I don't. I mean, the difference between countries with national health insurance and without national health insurance doesn't require a great deal of theoretical sophistication. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, 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 I don't think that I'm saying imagination, you know, has a hitherto unexpected power. I'm saying redescribing moral progress in terms of imagination rather than reason. Uh, might help to get rid of, you know, the element, what I think of as the sadomasochistic elements in our ways of thinking that uh, are getting in our way. But, you know, compared to national health insurance, this isn't terribly urgent. Uh, yeah. Just looking at uh, the, uh, the points that Oscar was making is something you often hear, I think, that, that uh, Pragmatists uh, this, just as they're insufficiently sensitive to the robustness of reality, so they have insufficient appreciation for the depth and complexity of the social challenges we face. And, and there's something flippant and naive about their response. They're lots just all become pragmatists and things will be fine. And, and it might be helpful when, when that kind of sentiment comes up to point out the difference between redescribing how to conceive of utopia, the terms in which we can, should think of utopia, and, um, and how to get there. Of, of course, um, it's true that once we get to anyone's utopia, things are by those standards hunky-dory. Right? Uh, so when you're talking about utopia, um, or talking about how to talk about utopia, if, if at that point somebody thinks you are talking about what it's necessary, what, how we should get there, and thinks that the way to get to utopia is to all become pragmatists, then that might create this sort of impression. But of course, describing a utopia in pragmatist terms says nothing about how likely it is or what we need, what, what we should do as general con or as particular concrete strategies to get there. Um, and so it's important, I think, to, to, to just dispel this illusion that for pragmatists, all we need to do is say, one, two, three, now let's all use the vocabulary, vocabulary, and utopia descends. And, and insofar as that sense is around, then you're going to keep getting these, these, these um, reactions that pragmatists aren't, aren't fully sensitive to them, mm. the depth and complexity. And um, I, I wonder if that was one of the things that The reaction is on. exactly the opposite. The, the utopia will never come because you, you, you don't have a strong enough vocabulary to convince people. Mm -hmm. Not that it's going to come, but that it isn't going to come. It's very nice of you to talk about it. And we may all agree about this utopia that the pragmatists like. But the question is how to get it. That the pragmatist thinks it's, what, too easy? The no, no, no. The pragmatists uh, have undercut us so strongly, not that I want to say reason is absolutely convincing. And as a medical rights person, I know that reason, is, I think I have very good reasons, and my students don't all stop eating hamburgers. So I know that reason is not absolutely convincing, but still I want to say 
well, you may not change your habits, but you are being inconsistent or something like that, you see. And it seems that the pragmatists want to kind of undercut all our arguments by saying, ah, you're being sadomasochistic, you're talking about absolute reason or something. No, but I want to have some force of something which, which is denying us. So the pragmatist talk of utopia is beautiful, but the question is, how are we going to get there? And, and it doesn't seem very likely. As Gordy just said to me, well, when we talk with Hitler, lots of love, but you're not going to get very far. Yeah, but that's the problem. I want to get there. But we help you to invoke. Well, we help you to invoke. You are inconsistent. You are shameless. You are something like that. No. To insult. Yeah. To insult or. But you can do that, of course. That's not against pragmatism. No, <laughs> we want to know we are true in consulting, uh, insulting us. Yes, but, but I can't say you, I can't add it is true, right? I mean, sure it, is. it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. We have to ask yourself, I mean, do you need these notions so that you won't feel bad when, when you find out what you say it makes no difference? At least you can feel vindicated. It's but not that I need to feel vindicated. I'm confused. That that it's what I need is. is for the other person to feel a little bit diminished, and but, or at least to feel, oh gosh, maybe I, I better rethink this problem. Yeah. You see, actually, Hitler was a vegetarian. You knew. Well, that's yeah. debatable. That's well, debatable. But, but the other, uh, but the other one can rethink it without feeling diminished. And that's a completely different. Well, I think that he's not going to rethink it if what he's doing is effective for his goals simply on my saying you should be thinking. I mean, Hitler's not going to rethink it if he unites Germany. But anyway, he is going to it. Yeah. No, but that, that, the problem <laughs> is, I think actually that you would be able to talk with Hitler. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's utterly impossible to, to say that moral vocabulary doesn't work at all. It does work. I mean, you can make people feel guilty. Uh, just by saying the words, say the words, bah, and then you, people feel guilty. It is a very forceful vocabulary. It has very strong rhetorics. And the point is that if that's a good achievement. I think it's that right. people feel guilty. Well, that's, so that's it's, the point. It's, 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 the thing is, it's natural. I mean, it's very natural. We have it. It's human reality. Uh, we have it for thousands of years, uh, in some way or the other, different content. But we had a little wrong moral cause. But like war, like uh, disease. But it's human like reality. I mean, it will continue. It will never be something like eternal peace. Maybe we can change it. We can think you're make trying it. to make a proposal for changing this kind of uh, As guilty, shameless vocabulary. As long as we do not recognize human reality. And that's what I feel is, is uh, denied us here, because human reality has always been moral. As long as this is denied us, as long as you want to undercut our use of moral vocabulary, which is a very strong human moral force, then, I mean, I feel it's even worse. There is nothing to stop human barbarism and things all like that. That's my conviction. But I, I mean, hear everything you're saying, and here is somebody a hundred years ago saying the same thing about theological vocabulary. Yeah. They're very I mean, much always, they've always been there. And who cares? If, if, you get, if you get rid of that, but then uh, you know, what force do we have to criticize people who can't threaten them with you know, the Father's wrath? What, 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 is, what, is, you know, what is our argument going to be? How are we going to trust them when they take an oath if they're not going to be threatened by this? And surely it was a good thing to get beyond that metaphysical fantasy behind our moral reasoning. Weren't we growing up when we said, no, this isn't about uh, old Nova Daddy in the sky, this is about how we human beings are going to deal with each other. And we've somehow got to get the rules that are important uh, to seem to be important without pretending that they're written into the non-human fabric of the world. No, but there's a big difference between saying, you're going against what Jesus taught or God or something and say you're being unreasonable or you're being unfair or you're being egotistical or something. Oh, but God's views really aren't being pulled out of the vocabulary, are they? Well, I think they are. Maybe here's a way to come at it. You and I are having an argument about some issue, whether it's good to do this or bad news. And finally I say to you, well, but have you considered that I may have truth and goodness on my side? Whoa, you go. Now there's a real, you know, that, that's the trunk. 
Is that going to be effective? Is that going to make a difference? Will that make you cringe? You know, after I've tried meticulously to lay out what the, all the consequences will be of doing what you suggest and try and show you why those consequences are consequences we should explore, and I have no success, and then I say, but I have truth and goodness on my side. Consider that. Is, is that going to be the kind of thing that will help resolve the argument or make you change your mind? I think if you call somebody a bad person, mm -hmm. as you call philosophy professor inconsistent, you say, oh gosh, am I being yeah. inconsistent? Well, or am I being paradoxical? Maybe I have to be a little bit, but I want to be as least as possible. Are you saying so, something more then than you are? Actually, right you are. Because, I mean, if we know each other already, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> if we know each other already, and I have a deep respect for you as a moral person, and if you say to me, well, actually what I'm saying is I'm expressing my moral point of view that you are wrong and I feel that it is truth, and, and if I respect you already, and that's, that's what I mean, I mean, there's a lack of understanding of human reality. If I understand you already, I mean, then you're saying something more. Then when I lay out all the specific exactly. reasons, which I would give as reasons for that yeah. judgment. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. that's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, but it seems to me we had a paragraph in today's lecture that specifically addressed that and said, look, those remarks do make a big difference, but it's not in the form of giving an additional reason for something. It's rather something like invoking the honor of the family or uh, uh, being a bad person. Uh, that's announcing that you've thought this through and this is where you stand uh, on it. And of course, that makes a difference, but, but it's a difference of a different kind than an additional reason in favor of taking a stand. And this is why you say, well, if, I, you know, if you have respect for the person, then their stand makes a difference. No problem. Right? This doesn't have any problems with that. Moral, he's just saying, saying don't misunderstand the status, the significance of that, as being another reason like, uh, well, that would be being beastly uh, to the person. You know, there's a sort of ground level reason. This other one is a, well, I can be no other. Here's my, here's my take. Well, it's, it's not the same. I mean, you were almost getting to it, but the last thing I have to say, when, when you say to me, I mean, you are wrong, uh, it is not just here I stand. This is a defensive position. He is using this moral force to make me act another way. Uh, and that's something which is quite different from just seeing here I stand. Okay, but it's also different from giving a substantive reason yeah. from which you should infer a conclusion. I should, my conclusion is I should act in another way. That's what he intends. And actually, he will succeed in it a lot of, a lot of times. But the, but the pragmatism is about the metaphysics that's behind this. It, there's no problem understanding how his taking that stand uh, should, should make a difference to you. But it doesn't have to do with its reflecting you know, the way some even non-theological right or rights uh, with, with this moral art. Well, what might happen? I'd say that say that we knew each other well, and you thought that I was a, a relevant moral compass, and we argue, and I say, look, you are wrong. There's a moral issue here. I'm saying, look carefully one more time at all my reasons, and see if you can't find that they are compelling after all. And if you respect me and trust my judgment, you would say, well, there's got to be something here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to reconsider the issue. It doesn't take you on to a different kind of reason. It brings you back again to the specific particular reasons that I'm trying to make. But I'm taking on another pair of glasses. I'm looking at them. Because if not, I'm looking at this already. Okay. It might not help. But that's what I say. I mean, then it's the moral makes a difference. I mean, you take on, I take on my moral glasses and I reconsider all what you have said to me in a moral kind of way. And that's a special moral thing. That's add something. It makes a difference that you have said moral. It has made me beep. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose I could summarize what I was trying to say as no, you don't put on a, new, a set of moral glasses. Uh, it becomes a moral matter when you begin to think 
I really don't know what to do in this situation. <laughs> you know, I'm really torn. Um, at that point, uh, unusual things happen, like people engaging in intense discussion with their friends and wondering whether, you know, the person they respect can disagree with them as heartily as he or she does and one can still retain one's confidence in one's own view and so on. I mean, I, I think it's just this metaphor of, you know, and then we put on the moral glasses that, you know, I would like to get rid of. Um, But if you ask why we should get rid of it, uh, I think it's, as Bob Brandom suggested, it's the same kind of reason that we got rid of saying, you'll go to hell if you eat the hamburger. Um, it, you know, it, the habit of saying you'll go to hell if you eat the hamburger or if you invade Poland or something, uh, you know, there was there was a familiar shift in you know people's sense of what made them sit up and think and you know what made them feel bad feeling bad about being told they'd be sent to hell and some of them not many got to feel bad about being told they were inconsistent um in this you know, pragmatist utopia, they will feel bad about being told they're insensitive instead of being told they're inconsistent. Uh, they will feel exactly as bad, no more, no less, on being told that they were insensitive uh, than readers of Kant feel when being told they're inconsistent or when you know, fundamentalist Christians are told when, that they go to hell. And you know it's, you know the the force of the term is constant over time. The actual term used varies depending on the cultural background. And I am proposing that in this wonderful culture, you still you know people feel just as conflicted, just as torn, just as guilty, just as whatnot. How could they not? <laughs> uh, but the rhetoric that is they and their friends use in these occasions is as different from ours as ours was from the days when you just said, you know, uh, you know, God doesn't like meat eaters. Uh, and, and, uh, seems that you are trying to refute um, a common criticism of pragmatism as being Epicureanism. Neo Epicureanism. Um, the bottom of the first paragraph, the top. Dewey agrees with Aristotle that human happiness cannot be reduced to the accumulation of pleasures. Um, invoke some of your favorite contemporary enemies, I suppose. Certain Marxists like uh, Terry Eagleton or um, Frederick Jameson would say that you precisely are providing justification for society based on nothing more than a dream of happiness that consists of accumulation of pleasures. I think maybe it was Jameson who talked about the fish Rorty Reagan axis or something like that. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> oh, yeah. but um, what kind of happiness should we aim for? If you disagree with, with their characterization of, of what you're doing or what, you're, or what kind of society you're supporting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think as Marxists tend to do, they think of the pleasures of the worker and the peasant who comes home to a hard, after a hard day's work at a good wage in a just society to relax in the company of his family over dinner as happiness, uh, whereas the um, you know, bachelor esthete who returns to his collection of pornography or the, uh, uh, you know, sensitive soul who reorders his collection of moths is having mere pleasures. <laughs> and I mean, you know, this is just a, this is just a Marxist trope where you, you contrast, you know, human happiness because workers and peasants are real and rich esthetes are, you know, they just have 
They don't have happiness. They're not worthy of happiness. They just have pleasures. Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I, this is, uh, I, I don't think that particular Marxist contrast is worth much. What Dewey's contrast was, in, when he attacked utilitarianism in human nature and conduct, what he was saying was um, the, the whole idea of adding up pleasures or utiles is crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, everyone always agreed, reading Bentham and Mill, that you know, uh, there wasn't any, there wasn't going to be any calculus around here. And Dewey simply said, right, everybody knows there isn't going to be any calculus, so why talk about this thing called pleasure of which there's supposed to be a calculus? Why don't we just talk, you know, in roughly Aristotelian terms about, you know, satisfaction, uh, fulfillment. Um, you know, realization of potentiality, growth, maturation, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I, I think the, the Eagleton kind of rhetoric is just, um, I don't know, I mean, it, it relies on nothing except this picture of a silly upper class or you know, a, a bunch of rich aesthetes. So as soon as you use the word um, sensitivity to somebody like Eagleton, all he can think about is, uh, you know, ability to tell one kind of Chinese porcelain apart from another Chinese kind of Chinese porcelain. And, uh, and I, I, I admit, I don't, I don't quite get Eagleton. I mean, it's, uh, there's a, his rhetoric is such a, you know, such a combination of sort of knee-jerk anti-Americanism with, uh, with traditional Marxism that it seems to me a very local, temporary kind of product. <laughs> mm. But Dewey often uses, uh, he often states growth as the ultimate goal of yeah. pragmatic society. Without getting metaphysical, how could you distinguish between uh, certain opportunities people have, certain uh, certain pleasures, certain certain sensitivities people can have, which are conducive to growth, and those which which are not painful? Dewey is going to say experiment, and nobody thinks that's a sufficient um, answer. But you know. It's no better or worse than Aristotle saying you find the mean by rocketing back and forth between the extremes until finally you settle down. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, at, at this point, it seems to me all moral philosophers are in exactly the same predicament. <laughs> well, before, remember, you said that basically, essentially, all the pragmatists can tell you is that you muddle through. Yeah. It wasn't, you don't want to, you're so cautious about using transcendental language that it seems uh, you risk risk losing some sort of vision that people can, can aim for. I mean, if you are experimenting and basically muddle through, I suppose that can be good to demystify certain notions of, of growth which might not be productive in the long run, but how would you propose? Yeah, I, I guess I think that, that um, vision, you know, In individual as opposed to social deliberation, vision is primarily a matter of exemplars, you know, real or imaginary persons whose lives one wishes one might live. Marxist intellectuals typically think of themselves of, as, you know, um, th think of the lives of the workers and peasants exhibited in works of socialist realist art as what they really want human beings, you know, what they really think the good life for man consists in, whether they, you know, believe this or not. Uh, other people have other visions, but I don't think you read a philosophy book to get a vision of, you know, human, of uh, an ideal human life, you read, you know, Plutarch's lives or, 
George Eliot or something like that. Uh, yeah. Can you speak through the pleasure versus the other uh, things? I think this came up before, but maybe it's worth repeating. Uh, the fascination of the pleasure pain calculus or whatever was really a Cartesian one. It was the idea, well, whatever else could be said about pleasure pain's output measures, you knew right now exactly how much of it you had. You knew everything there was to know about how much of it you had right now. Uh, so even people who are sort of gripped in this say, well, yeah, there is a problem with calculus because how can we compare what I know everything about, the amount of pleasure and pain I've got right now, and what you've got? Oh, it's just a, a problem of other minds that, that's a, a dead giveaway that it's a Cartesian picture. The big move is, to, is just to say, well, whatever the output measure that matters for practical deliberation or moral, if you like. It's not like that. It's, it, it, we can call it satisfaction of desires. That's it, in a sort of uh, uh, or even Aristotelian way. It, it doesn't matter much what we call it, as long as we admit that uh, how you're doing is a question that's as much up for grabs and for differences of opinions uh, about it as any other empirical, any other empirical matter. I mean, that's what's behind the sort of experimental idea. Take, look, there's no point at which you're going to be able to say, well, at least we've got this much of that. That they can't take away from you. No, you might find out tomorrow that uh, your desires were not being satisfied, that, that you were not, in fact, happier, though you, it had sort of seemed to you that you were. And somebody else might turn out to know more about it than, than you do. So it seems to me the, the important uh, place to get off the utilitarian bus is to say, well, that depends on this Cartesian picture. Uh, anything other than that is going to give us an experimental picture where we've got to worry that tomorrow we're going to find out more about it or that there's some better way of doing it or whatever. Uh, and if that's the point that, that Dewey wants to make, uh, then he can use a very sketchy notion of, sort of what it is we're trying we're trying to do. It's just not one of these things where you know everything about how it's going. Right? Yeah. And then, just one more bit about pleasure and happiness. I mean, what, what really did in utilitarianism was not Dickens' depiction of grad grind, it was Huxley's Brave New World. Uh, I mean, stories like Forrester's The Machine Stops and Brave New World and similar things where you know, you were presented with a picture of technology simply having people sitting around having the pleasure centers in their brains stimulated and all of a sudden it dawned on you, that can't be what I had in mind as the goal of human life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You made the, an, an analogy between scientific progress and moral progress. And in this sense you say that scientific progress is a matter of integrating more and more data into a coherent web of belief. Then, in scientific progress, coherence seems to be a constraint in integrating that. Uh, what, what seems to be a constraint? Uh, coherence. Oh, coherence, yeah. Uh, can you say below, moral progress is a matter of wider and wider sympathy. Then my question is, what is, if any, the analogous constraint for integrating people in moral progress? The analogous constraint for? The, the analogous constraint for integrating people in moral progress. The constraint analogous to coherence in scientific progress. Well, I guess just the development of social institutions that will you know, obey the directions of Mills on liberty, you know, ma ma maximizing the space for um, private projects of self-creation uh, without hurting anybody else. Um, so it is the kind of moral conflict that could be the analogy of logical conflict or epistemic conflict? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we keep 
trying to reform the system of laws so as to fix it so people uh, can get more out of life but still not get in each other's way. Um, and, you know, the laws used to be harsher because it, you know, because there wasn't as much money around, roughly. Uh, and so, you know, you had, to, you had to make people do a lot of stuff they didn't want to do uh, in order to prevent them from hurting each other. And now you can give them a little more leeway because there's more money and leisure around. But um, maybe I'm missing the point. Or, uh, I don't know if maybe putting in another way. I, I, I do think, perhaps I understand you right. I think he's looking for a category in the moral uh, well, world, uh, analogous to the category or to the word coherence yeah. in the scientific yeah, that, That's the point, but if the answer is that is that this, is this kind of, of uh, general tolerance here or something like that, then my question is, uh, of course this kind of, of constraint is, is fussy. Is 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 fussy. Is is not uh, sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Then, uh, do you think the same about coherence in 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 scientific yeah. realm? Yeah. So coherence in scientific realm is uh, fussy notion. Yeah, I mean, I, th there's an essay of Kuhn's uh, where he says, uh, here are about 12 thing, twelve desiderata that a scientific theory ought to fulfill. It ought to be able to, predictive efficiency, uh, compatibility with theories and other nearby disciplines, fruitfulness, elegance, and you know, he's got six more. And he says, the good scientist is the guy who can, you know, work out an imaginative satisfaction of 12 criteria at once. <laughs> I know that the balance between coherence, logical coherence, and other things like aesthetic view or something like that is fast. I know that. But my question is, is just one of that parameters, logical coherence, fast in itself? Because I know that no. if we, if we no. must balance, of course no. we have problems of no. where to begin and when. I, mean, I think of logical coherence itself as very cheaply bought. Because any time somebody says you've contradicted yourself, all you have to do is introduce a distinction and say, no, I didn't actually. You failed to notice the ambiguity between these two senses of, of a term. I mean, anybody can be coherent if they're clever enough. <laughs> but, you know, that, that doesn't get you much. Uh, and and it's, 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 so to speak, you know, um, you know, I mean, to, to pride oneself on coherence is merely to, you know, you know, pride oneself on skill in argumentative interchange, and that, you know, that isn't enough to be a good scientist. I mean, you, you know, a lot of other stuff you got to bear in mind. It isn't enough to be a good politician either. And the, the symptom in. Uh moral community of moral conflict is something like if there is someone pushing other people or just like a stone in your, in your shoe or something like that. Yeah. This is quite the whole we can expect about moral conflict characterization. Well, there, is, there is someone just making us uncomfortable. Um. Like when you have data and theories, mm -hmm. and you feel well, it is something that it makes me, it, it makes me feel me uncomfortable. It is the same kind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, some some people's existence strikes you as intolerable. Uh, a scientist looks at the reading on his instrument and says, "This is intolerable." <laughs> you know, I mean, that. You know, the instrument must be wrong, or, you know, quantum physics has come crashing to the ground, or, you know, there must be, you know, I got to do something with this datum. <laughs> uh, you know, we got to do something with this person. Uh, I mean, you know, I, you know, there are obvious differences, but I think it's a reasonable way of linking the two areas.
Nie? I guess that uh, we can say that I identify with uh, myself or that we identify with ourselves. So uh, does this quote uh, mean that you don't that you deny the problem, the moral problem of uh, committing suicide? That's that's my first. Uh, I mean, if if we, if there is such a, a moral problem or a moral obligation only as long as we don't identify with. Uh, the object of our overall moral obligation doesn't mean that we don't have uh, such such a moral problem as uh, have to have we to commit suicide. And, um, the other the other problems uh, I have in your text is that um, in page 17 you say uh, that we can aim at what is right, but it can aim at even more sensitivity to pain and even greater satisfaction of ever more various needs. Also in your text, uh, contingency, solidarity, and, and, and contingency, irony, and solidarity, you say that uh, solidarity is the ability uh, to see more and more traditional difference as impor important when compared with um, similarities with respect to pain and humiliation. But then, on the other hand, you say on page uh, 25 that uh, pain is nothing distinctively human, and uh, that there is nothing distinctively human about the pain. How can you yeah. understand I, this? I prefer my later view. You're right. I mean, you're right. It's it's a contradiction, and I was right the second time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. But I'm, about suicide, yeah, I guess I can't see it as a moral problem. Uh, um, it's a moral problem. No, I, I can't see it as a moral problem. Uh, and I, you know, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, lots of things that we used to think were moral problems now strike us as, you know, not moral problems, and suicide strikes me as one of them. It's, uh, um, I, I get another way of putting that is to say, um, with the increase in tolerance, wealth, leisure, whatnot, we are in the habit of saying about more and more decisions people make. Well, it's their business. You know, we do. We, you know, we shouldn't really try to advise them on this. And I think we've come to say that more and more about suicide. Yeah. Um, well, reading again from this page 17 in your paper, where you say that more or less this programmatical analysis of moral is going to be parallel to this of, of science somehow, I read that you know, the thoughts that you want to develop are more or less an Darwinian uh, kind of affinity. I mean, you've, you've talked already on you know, all these lectures that there is such affinity with the Darwinian vocabulary to describe things that happen in social practice. Th there is such a th such an affinity with uh, with the Darwinian vocabulary mm -hmm. to describe social practices and so on. Well, um, then would it be completely a disaster to talk uh, um, in your terms of the moral law, like a, like the natural law, in Darwinian terms? Right? I mean, talking about moral progress as natural evolution and so on. I mean, are you, are you, talk, are you speaking of, of moral law and moral progress in these terms? Because then I, I have a problem. But it might be a pseudo problem, I don't know. Um, this problem is, um, what do you do? I mean, my question is not, what do you do with, with other utopias? They are utopias and such, such you respect them or you don't, but they are utopias, they are there. But what do you do with people who cannot even get the chance of imagining an utopia? Or putting, putting it in Darwinian terms, what do you do with the deer out in the jungle, which is, I don't know, uh, enjoying the sunshine, not paying attention enough, and gets caught by the lion? 
I mean, what do you what do you do with people that, as you say, well, um, you find you, you find yourself associated associated in this utopia uh, with people who find it natural natural to act like this, like you act. For instance, what is the description in page twenty two? Or you say, uh, uh, some other things. But if you think that this utopia is a matter of wider and wider sympathy, or if you say in, in, in page 17, getting more and more human beings into our community, what do you do with people that don't even have the chance to be a part of your community? Or, I mean, Brandon was also talking about uh, describing us and ourselves and we in these social practices, to put it up in another words, who is this we in your social utopia? And the, well, that's what I want to talk about in the paper this afternoon. I mean, but, but, I, but I'm not sure that it gives you much of an answer because all I'm going to say is uh, we, for purposes of this discussion, we are the people who worry about the people who have no chance to be included in our society. And, you know, uh, the, I mean, what seems to me good about the liberal post-French Revolution societies of Europe and America is that they, you know, they worry about, hey, what are we going to do about Bangladesh? And, you know, what are we going to do about the farmers who aren't making it in the South? And, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, this, is, this has not been a common human preoccupation <laughs> to, you know, have that kind of worry. Well, we are the ones who engage in that kind of worry. I, but I, I don't see that there's a general answer to the question, you know, what about these people? Uh, I mean, often the answer is, you know, there's nothing to be done. Let's hope things might be better for their children. Maybe we can do something for them. <laughs> uh. But then these questions, more or less, seem almost to be the I guess I think that, 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 the whole idea of natural law is an unhappy metaphor. I mean, it, you know, there are generalizations which prove useful in manipulating the world, and we call the most spectacular of them the laws of nature. But you know, if we didn't if we didn't have this juridical metaphor, it wouldn't nothing would be laws. We are not thinking of moral progress in terms of evolution. No, I mean, evolution is just a series of chance mutations which fit by chance into various niches. And, you know, it's, it's hardly unidirectional. I mean, biological evolution, you know, uh, wasted an awful lot of time on the dinosaurs when it might have hurried up and got us mammals. Uh, you know, Europe wasted a lot of time on the Dark Ages when it might have had a, a renaissance, you know, a long time before. Uh, you know, in neither case do you get anything, you just get, you know, lots of ups and downs. This last one is called Justice as a Larger Loyalty. All of us would expect help if pursued by the police we asked our family to hide us. Most of us would extend such help even when we know our child or our parent to be guilty of a sordid crime. Many of us would be willing to perjure ourselves in order to supply such a child or parent with a false alibi. But if an innocent person is wrongly convicted as a result of our perjury, most of us will be torn by a conflict between loyalty and justice. Such a conflict will be felt, however, only to the extent to which we can identify with the innocent person whom we've harmed. If the person is a neighbor, the conflict will probably be intense. If a stranger, especially one of a different race, class, or nation, it may be considerably weaker. There has to be some sense that he or she is one of us before we start being tormented by the question of whether we did the right thing when we committed perjury. So it might be equally appropriate to describe us as torn between conflicting loyalties, loyalty to our family and to a group large enough to include the victim of our perjury, rather than between loyalty and justice. Our loyalty to such larger groups will, however, weaken or even vanish altogether when things get really tough. 
then people whom we once thought of as like ourselves will be excluded. Sharing food with impoverished people down the street is natural and right in normal times, but perhaps not in a famine when doing so amounts to disloyalty to one's family. The tougher things get, the more ties of loyalty to those near at hand tighten, and the more those to everyone else slacken. Consider another example of expanding and contracting loyalties, our attitude toward other species. Most of us nowadays are at least half convinced that the vegetarians have a point and that animals do have some sort of rights. But suppose that the cows or the kangaroos turn out to be carriers of a newly mutated virus, which though harmless to them is invariably fatal to humans. I suspect that we would then shrug off accusations of speciesism and participate in the necessary massacre. The idea of justice between species will suddenly become irrelevant because things have gotten very tough indeed and our loyalty to our own species must come first. Loyalty to a larger community, that of all living creatures on our home planet, would under such circumstances quickly fade away. As a final example, consider the tough situation created by the accelerating export of jobs from the first world to the third. There's likely to be a continuing decline in the average real income of most Americans, or for that matter, most European families. Much of this decline can plausibly be attributed to the fact that you could hire a factory worker in Thailand for a tenth of what you'd have to pay in Ohio or Catalonia. It's become the conventional wisdom of the rich that U.S. and European labor is overpriced on the world market. When American business people are told that they're being disloyal to the U.S. by leaving whole cities in our rust belt without work or hope, they sometimes reply that they place justice above loyalty. They argue that the needs of humanity as a whole take moral precedence over those of their fellow citizens and override national loyalties. Justice requires, they say, that they act as citizens of the world. Consider now the plausible hypothesis that democratic institutions and freedoms are viable only when supported by an economic affluence which is achievable regionally, but impossible globally. If this hypothesis is correct, democracy and freedom in the first world will not be able to survive a thoroughgoing globalization of the labor market. So the rich democracies face a choice between perpetuating their own democratic institutions and traditions and dealing justly with the third world. Doing justice to the third world would require exporting capital and jobs until everything is leveled out. Until an honest day's work in a ditch or at a computer earns no higher a wage in Cincinnati or Paris than in a small town in Botswana. But then it can plausibly be argued there will be no money to support free public libraries, competing newspapers and networks, widely available liberal arts education, and all the other institutions which are necessary to produce enlightened public opinion, and thus to keep governments more or less democratic. What on this hypothesis is the right thing for the rich democracies to do? Be loyal to themselves and each other? keep free societies going for a third of mankind at the expense of the remaining two-thirds, or sacrifice the blessings of political liberty for the sake of egalitarian economic justice. These questions parallel those confronted by the parents of a large family after a nuclear holocaust. Do they share the food supply they've stored in the basement with their neighbors, even though the stores will then last only a day or two? Or do they fend these neighbors off with guns? Both moral dilemmas bring up the same question. Should we contract the circle for the sake of loyalty or expand it for the sake of justice? I have no idea of the right answer to these questions, neither about the right thing for these parents to do nor about the right thing for the first world to do. I pose them simply to get a more abstract and merely philosophical question into focus. That is, should we describe such moral dilemmas as these as conflicts between loyalty and justice, or rather, as I suggested we might, between loyalties to smaller groups and loyalties to larger groups. This amounts to asking, would it be a good idea to treat justice as the name for loyalty to a certain very large group, the name for our largest current loyalty, rather than the name of something distinct from loyalty? Could we replace the notion of justice with that of loyalty to that group? For example, one's fellow citizens, or the human species, or all living things. Would anything be lost by that replacement? 
moral philosophers who remain loyal to Kant are likely to think that a lot would be lost. Kantians typically insist that justice springs from reason and loyalty from sentiment. Only reason, they say, can impose universal and unconditional moral obligations, and our obligation to be just is of this sort. It's on another level from the sort of affectional relations which create loyalty. Jürgen Habermas is the most prominent contemporary philosopher to insist on this Kantian way of looking at things. The thinker least willing to blur, the, blur either the line between reason and sentiment or the line between universal validity and historical consensus. But contemporary philosophers who depart from Kant either in the direction of Hume, like Annette Bayer, or in the direction of Hegel, like Charles Taylor, or in that of Aristotle, like Alastair MacIntyre, are not so sure. Michael Walzer is at the other extreme from Habermas. He's wary of terms like reason and universal moral obligation. The heart of his book, Thick and Thin, is the claim that we should reject the intuition that Kant took as central, the intuition that, quote, men and women everywhere begin with some common idea or principle or set of ideas and principles which they then work up in many different ways, close quotes. Walter thinks that this picture of morality starting thin and thickening with age should be inverted. He says that, quote, morality is thick from the beginning, culturally integrated, fully resonant, and it reveals itself thinly only on special occasions when moral language is turned to special purposes, close quote. Walter's inversion suggests, though it doesn't entail, the neo-Humean picture of morality sketched by Annette Beyer in her book Moral Prejudices, on Byers' account, as I was saying this morning, morality starts out not as an obligation, but as a relation of reciprocal trust among a closely knit group, such as a family or clan. To behave morally is to do what comes naturally in one's dealings with parents and children, or with fellow clan members. It amounts to respecting the trust they place in you. Obligation as opposed to trust enters the picture only when your loyalty to a smaller group conflicts with your loyalty to a larger group. When, for example, the family is confederated into tribes or the tribes into nations, you may feel obliged to do what does not come naturally, to leave your parents in the lurch by going off to fight in the wars, or to rule against your own village in your capacity as a federal administrator or judge. What Kant would describe as the resulting conflict between moral obligation and sentiment, or between reason and sentiment, is on a non-Kantian account of the matter, a conflict between one set of loyalties and another set of loyalties. The idea of a universal moral obligation to respect human dignity gets replaced by the idea of loyalty to a very large group, the human species. The idea that moral obligation extends beyond that species to an even larger group becomes the idea of loyalty to all those who, like yourself, can experience pain, even the cows and the kangaroos, or perhaps even to all living things, even the trees. This non-Kantian view of morality can be re rephrased as the claim that one's moral identity is determined by the group or groups with which one identifies, the group or groups to which one cannot be disloyal and still like oneself. Moral dilemmas are not, in this view, the result of a conflict between reason and sentiment, but between alternative selves, alternative self-descriptions, alternative ways of giving a meaning to one's life. Non-Kantians don't think that we have a central true self by virtue of our membership in the human species, a self which responds to the call of reason. They can instead agree with Daniel Dennett that a self is a center of narrative gravity. In non-traditional societies, most people have several such narratives at their disposal, and thus several different moral identities. It's this plurality of, identi of identities which accounts for the number and variety of moral dilemmas, moral philosophers, and psychological novels in such societies. Waltz's contrast between thick and thin morality is, among other things, a contrast between the detailed and concrete stories you can tell about yourself as a member of a smaller group and the relatively abstract and sketchy story you can tell about yourself as a citizen of the world. You know more about your family than about your village, more about your village than about your nation, more about your nation than about humanity as a whole, more about being human than about simply being a living creature. You're in a better position to decide what differences between individuals are morally relevant when dealing with those whom you can describe thickly, 
and in a worse position when dealing with those whom you can only describe thinly. This is why as groups get larger, law has to replace custom and abstract principles have to replace phrenesis. So Kantians are wrong to see phrenesis as a thickening up of thin abstract principles. Plato and Kant were misled by the fact that abstract principles are designed to trump parochial loyalties into thinking that the principles are somehow prior to the loyalties, that the thin is somehow prior to the thick. Or if Plato and Kant weren't misled, somebody was. There's a tradition around here somewhere to <laughs> this effect. <laughs> Walzer's thick-thin dis distinction can be allied with Rawls's contrast between a shared concept of justice and various conflicting conceptions of justice. Rawls sets out that contrast as follows, quote, the concept of justice applied to an institution means, say, that the institution makes no arbitrary distinctions between persons in assigning basic rights and duties, and that its rules establish a proper balance between competing claims. A conception includes, besides this, principles and criteria for deciding which distinctions are arbitrary and when a balance between competing claims are proper. People can agree on the meaning of justice and still be at odds since they affirm different principles and standards for deciding these matters. Phrased in Rawls's terms, Walter's point is that thick, fully resonant conceptions of justice, complete with distinctions between the people who matter most and the people who matter less, come first. The thin concept and its maxim, don't make arbitrary distinctions between moral subjects, is articulated only on special occasions. On these occasions, the thin concept can often be turned against any of the thick conceptions from which it emerged in the form of critical questions about whether it may not be entirely arbitrary to think that certain people matter more than others. Neither Rawls nor Walzer think, however, that unpacking the thin concept of justice will by itself resolve such critical questions by supplying a criterion of arbitrariness. They don't think we can do what some people think Kant hoped to do, derive solutions to moral dilemmas from the analysis of moral concepts. To put, the point in the terminal, to put the point in the terminology I'm suggesting, we cannot resolve conflicting loyalties by turning away from the moral towards something categorically distinct from loyalty, the universal moral obligation to act justly. So we have to drop the Kantian idea that the moral law starts off pure, but is always in danger of being contaminated by irrational feelings which introduce an arbitrary discriminations among persons. We have to substitute the Hegelian Marxist idea that the so-called moral law is at best a handy abbreviation for a concrete web of social practices. This means dropping Habermas's claim that his discourse ethics articulates a transcendental presupposition of the use of language and accepting his critics' groups in a more concrete form. Consider the question of whether the demands for reform made on the rest of the world by Western liberal societies are made in the name of something not merely Western, something like morality or humanity or rationality, or are simply expressions of loyalty to local Western conceptions of justice. Habermas would say that they're the former, I'd say that they're the latter, but none the worse for that. I think it's better not to say that the liberal West is better informed about rationality and justice, and instead to say that in making demands on liberal, non-liberal societies, it is simply being true to itself. In, the re in a recent paper called The Law of Peoples, Rawls discusses the question of whether the conception of justice which he has developed in his books is something peculiarly Western and liberal, or rather something universal. He would like to be able to claim universality. He says it's important to avoid historicism, and he believes he can do this if he can show that the conception of justice suited to a liberal society can be extended beyond such societies through formulating what he calls the law of peoples. He outlines in that paper an extension of the constructivist procedure proposed in his book, A Theory of Justice, an extension which, by continuing to separate the right from the good, lets us encompass liberal and non-liberal societies under the same law. As Rawls develops this constructivist proposal, however, it emerges that this law applies only to reasonable people, in a quite specific sense of the term reasonable. The conditions which non-liberal societies must honor in order to be, quote, accepted by liberal societies in me as members in good standing of the society of peoples, quote, quote, include the following, quote, 
Its system of law must be guided by a common good conception of justice that takes impartially into account what it sees not unreasonably as the fundamental interests of all members of society. Rawls takes the fulfillment of that condition to rule out violation of basic human rights. These rights include at least, quote, quoting from Rawls, certain minimum rights to means of subsistence and security, the right to life, to liberty, freedom from slavery, serfdom, and forced occupations, and personal property, as well as to formal equality as expressed by the rules of natural justice, for example, that similar cases be treated similarly. Close quotes. When Rawls spells out what he means by saying that the admissible non-liberal societies must not have unreasonable philosophical or religious doctrines, he glosses the term unreasonable by saying that these societies must, quote, admit a measure of liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, even if these freedoms are not in general equal for all members of society, close quotes. Rawls's notion of what is reasonable, in short, confines membership of the Society of Peoples to societies whose institutions encompass most of the hard-won achievements of the West in the two centuries since the Enlightenment. It seems to me that Rawls cannot both reject historicism and invoke this notion of reasonableness. For the effect of that invocation is to build most of the West's recent decisions about which distinctions between people are arbitrary into the conception of justice which is implicit in the law of peoples. The difference between different conceptions of justice, remember, the differences between different conceptions of justice, remember, are differences between what features of people are seen as relevant to the adjudication of their competing claims. There's obviously enough wriggle room in phrases like similar cases should be treated similarly to allow for arguments that believers and infidels, men and women, blacks and whites, gays and straight, should be treated as relevantly dissimilar. So there's room to argue that discrimination on the basis of such differences is not arbitrary. If we're going to exclude from the society of people societies in which infidel homosexuals are not permitted to engage in certain occupations, those societies can quite reasonably say that we are, in excluding them, appealing not to something universal, but to very recent developments in Europe and America. I agree with Habermas when he says that, quote, what Rawls in fact prejudges with the concept of an overlapping consensus is the distinction between modern and pre-modern forms of consciousness, between reasonable and dogmatic world interpretations, close quotes. But I disagree with Habermas, as I think Walzer also would, when he goes on to say that Rawls, quote, can defend the primacy of the right over the good with the concept of an overlapping consensus only if it is true that post-metaphysical worldviews that have become reflexive under modern conditions are epistemically superior to dogmatically fixed fundamental, fundamentalistic worldviews, indeed, indeed only if such a distinction can be made with absolute clarity." Close quotes. Habermas's point is that Rawls needs an argument for transcultur from transculturally valid premises for the superiority of the liberal West. Without such an argument, he says, quote, the disqualification of unreasonable doctrines that cannot be brought into harmony with the proposed political conception concept of justice is inadmissible, close quote. Such passages make clear why Habermas and Walzer are at opposite poles. Walzer is taking for granted that there can be no such thing as a non-question begging demonstration of the epistemic superiority of the Western idea of reasonableness. There is for Walzer no tribunal of transcultural reason before which one could try the question of superiority. Walzer is presupposing what Habermas calls a strong contextualism for which there is no single rationality. On this conception, Habermas continues, quote, individual rationalities are correlated with different cultures, worldviews, traditions, or forms of life. Each of them is viewed as internally interwoven with a particular understanding of the world, close quote. I think that Rawls's constructivist approach to the law of peoples can work if he adopts what Habermas calls a strong constructivism. But doing so would mean giving up the attempt to escape historicism, as well as the attempt to supply a universalistic argument for the West's most recent views about which differences between persons are arbitrary. The strength of Walzer's book, Thick and Thin, seems to me its explicitness about the need to do that. 
the weakness of Rawls' account of what he's doing lies in an ambiguity between two senses of universalism. When Rawls says that a constructivist liberal doctrine is universal in its reach once it is extended to a law of peoples, he's not saying that it's universal in its validity. Universal reach is a notion which sits well with constructivism, but universal validity is not. It's the latter that Habermas requires. That's why Habermas thinks that we need really heavy philosophical weaponry modeled on Kant's, why he thinks that only transcendental presuppositions of any possible communicative practice will do the job. To be faithful to his own constructivism, I think, Rawls has to agree with Walzer that this job just doesn't need to be done. <laughs> Rawls and Habermas often invoke, and Walzer almost never invokes, the notion of reason. In Habermas, that notion is always bound up with the notion of context-free validity. But in Rawls, things are more complicated. Rawls distinguishes the reasonable from the rational, using the latter to mean simply the sort of means and rationality which is employed in engineering or in working out a Hobbesian modus vivendi. But he often invokes a third notion, that of practical reason, as when he says that the authority of a constructivist liberal, doc of a constructivist liberal doctrine quote, rests on the principles and conceptions of practical reason, close quotes. Rawls' use of this Kantian term may make it sound as if he agreed with Kant and Habermas that there is a universally distributed human faculty called practical reason existing prior to and working quite independently of the recent history of the West, a faculty which tells us what counts as an arbitrary distinction between persons and what doesn't. Such a faculty would do the job Habermas thinks needs doing, detecting transcultural moral validity. But this can't, I think, be what Rawls intends. For he also says that his own constructivism differs from all philosophical views which appeal to a source of authority, and in which, quote, the universality of the doctrine is the direct consequence of its source of authority, close quotes. As examples of sources of authority, he cites quote, human reason, or an independent realm of moral values, or some other proposed basis of universal validity, close quotes. In other words, Rawls is, you know, an anti-authoritarian in my sense of the term. So I think we have to construe his phrase, the principles and conceptions of practical reason, close quote, as referring to whatever principles and conceptions are in fact arrived at in the course of creating a community. Rawls emphasizes that creating a community is not the same thing as working out a modus vivendi, a task which requires only means and rationality, not practical reason. A principle or conception belongs to practical reason in Rawls' sense. If it emerged in the course of people starting thick and getting thin, thereby developing an overlapping consensus and setting up a more inclusive moral community. Practical reason for Rawls is, so to speak, a matter of procedure rather than of substance, of how we agree on what to do rather than of what we agree on. This definition of practical reason suggests that there may be only a verbal difference between Rawls's and Habermas's positions. For Habermas's own attempt to substitute communicative reason for subject-centered reason is itself a move toward substituting how for what. The first sort of reason is a source of truth, truth somehow coeval with the human mind. The second sort of reason is not a source of anything, but simply the activity of justifying claims by offering arguments rather than, for example, threats. Like Rawls, Habermas focuses on the difference between persuasion and force rather than, as Plato and Kant did, on the difference between two parts of the human person, the good rational part and the dubious passionate or sensual part. Both would like to de-emphasize the notion of the authority of reason, the idea of reason as a faculty which issues decrees, and substitute the notion of rationality as what is present whenever people communicate, whenever they try to justify their claims to one another, rather than threatening each other. The similarities between Rawls and Habermas seem even greater in the light of Rawls's endorsement of Thomas Scanlon's answer to, quote, the fundamental question of why anyone should care about morality at all, close quotes, namely that, 
quoting Scanlon, we have a basic desire to be able to justify our actions to others on grounds that they could not reasonably reject, reasonably that is, given the desire to find principles that others similarly motivated could not reasonably reject. Close quote. This suggests that the two philosophers might agree on the following claim. The only notion of rationality we need, at least in moral and social philosophy, is that of a situation in which people do not say, your own current interests dictate that you agree to our proposal, but rather, your own central beliefs, the ones which are central to your own moral identity, suggest that you should agree to our proposal. This notion of rationality can be delimited using Walzer's terminology by saying that rationality is found wherever people envisage the possibility of getting from different thicks to the same thin. To appeal to interests rather than beliefs is to urge a modus vivendi. Such an appeal is exemplified by the speech of the Athenian ambassadors to the unfortunate millions, as reported by Thucydides. To appeal to your enduring beliefs as well as to your current interests is to suggest that what gives you your present moral identity, your thick and resonant complex of beliefs, may make it possible for you to develop a new supplementary moral identity. It's to suggest that what makes you loyal to a smaller group may give you reason to cooperate in constructing a larger group, a, lo a group to which you may in time become equally loyal, or perhaps even more loyal. The difference between the absence and the presence of rationality on this account is the difference between a threat and an offer, the offer of a new moral identity and thus a new and larger loyalty, a loyalty to a group formed by an unforced agreement between smaller groups. In the hope of minimizing the contrast between Habermas and Rawls still further, and of rapprochement between both and Walzer, I want to suggest a way of thinking of rationality which might help to resolve the problem I posed earlier, the problem of whether justice and loyalty are different sorts of things, or whether the demands of justice are simply the demands of a larger loyalty. I said that question seemed to boil down to the question of whether justice and loyalty have different sources, reason and sentiment, respectively. If the latter distinction disappears, the former will not seem particularly useful. But if by rationality we mean simply the sort of activity which Walzer thinks of as a thinning out process, the sort that with luck achieves the formulation and utilization of an overlapping consensus, the un then the idea that justice has a different source than loyalty no longer seems plausible. For on this account of rationality, being rational and acquiring a larger loyalty are two descriptions of the same activity. This is because any unforced agreement between individuals and groups about what to do creates a form of community and will, with luck, be the initial stage in expanding the circles of those whom each party to the agreement had previously taken to be people like ourselves. The opposition between rational argument and fellow feeling thus begins to dissolve, for fellow feeling may, and often does, arise from the realization that the people whom one thought one might have to go to war with use force on, are, in Rawls's sense, reasonable. They are, it turns out, enough like us to see the point of compromising differences in order to live in peace and of abiding by the agreement that has been hammered out. They are, to some degree at least, trustworthy. From this point of view, Habermas's distinction between a strategic use of language and a genuinely communicative use of language begins to look like a difference between positions on a spectrum a spectrum of degrees of trust. Byers' suggestion that we take trust rather than obligation to be our fundamental moral concept would thus produce a blurring of the line between rhetorical manipulation and genuine validity-seeking argument, a line which I think Habermas draws too sharply. If we cease to think of reason as a source of authority and think of it simply as the process of reaching agreement by persuasion, then the standard dichotomy of reason and feeling begins to fade away. That dichotomy can be replaced by a continuum of degrees of overlap of beliefs and desires. When people whose beliefs and desires do not overlap very much disagree, they tend to think of each other as crazy, or more politely, as irrational. When there's considerable overlap, on the other hand, they may agree to differ and regard each other as the sort of people one can live with and eventually perhaps the sort one can be friends with, intermarry with, and so on. 
To advise people to be rational is, on the view I'm offering, simply to suggest that somewhere among their shared beliefs and desires, there may be enough resources to permit agreement on how to coexist without violence. To conclude that somebody is irredeemably irrational is not to realize that she is not making proper use of her God-given faculties. It's rather to realize that she doesn't seem to share enough relevant beliefs and desires with us to make possible fruitful conversation about the issue in dispute. So we reluctantly conclude we have to give up on the attempt to get her to enlarge her moral identity and settle for working out a modus vivendi, one which may involve the threat or even the use of force. A stronger, more Kantian rational notion of rationality would be invoked if one said that being rational guarantees a peaceful resolution of conflicts, that if people are willing to reason together long enough, what Habermas calls the force of the better argument will lead them to concur. This stronger notion strikes me as pretty useless. I, need, I see no point in saying that it's more rational to prefer one's neighbors to one's family in the event of a nuclear holocaust, or more rational to prefer leveling off incomes around the world to preserving the, institu preserving the institutions of liberal Western societies. To use the word rational to commend one's chosen solution to such dilemmas, or to use the term yielding to the force of the better argument to characterize one's way of making up one's mind is to pay oneself an empty compliment. More generally, the idea of the better argument makes sense only if one can identify a natural transcultural relation of relevance, which connects propositions with one another so as to form something like Descartes' natural order of reasons. Without such a natural order, one can only evaluate arguments by their efficacy in producing agreement among particular persons or groups. But the required notion of natural intrinsic relevance, relevance dictated not by the needs of any given community, but by human reason as such, seems no more plausible or useful than that of a god whose will can be appealed to in order to resolve conflicts between communities. It is, I think, merely a secularized version of that earlier notion. Non-Western societies in the past were rightly skeptical of Western conquerors who explained that they were invading in obedience to divine commands. More recently, they have been skeptical of Westerners who suggest they should adopt Western ways in order to become more rational. This suggestion has been abbreviated by Ian Hacking as me rational you Jane. <laughs> On the account of rationality I'm recommending, both forms of skepticism are equally justified. But this is not to deny that these societies should adopt recent Western ways by, for example, abandoning slavery, practicing religious toleration, educating women, permitting mixed marriages, tolerating homosexuality and conscientious objection to war, and so on. As a loyal Westerner, I think they should indeed do all these things. I agree with Rawls about what it takes to count as reasonable and about what kind of societies we Westerners should accept as members of a global moral community. But I think that the rhetoric we Westerners use in trying to get everybody to be more like us would be improved if we were more frankly ethnocentric and less professedly universalist. It would be better to say, here is what we in the West look like as a result of ceasing to hold slaves, beginning to educate women, separating church and state, and so on. Here is what happened after we started treating certain distinctions between people as arbitrary rather than fraught with moral significance. If you would try treating them that way, you might like the results. Saying that sort of thing seems preferable to saying, look at how much better we are at knowing what differences between persons are arbitrary and which not, how much more rational we are. If we Westerners could get rid of the notion of universal moral obligations created by membership in the species and substitute the idea of building a community of trust between ourselves and others, we might be in a better position to persuade non-Westerners of the advantages of joining in that community. We might be better able to construct the sort of global moral community which Rawls describes in his article, The Law of Peoples. In making this suggestion, I'm urging, as I have on earlier, in earlier lectures, that we need to peel apart Enlightenment liberalism from Enlightenment rationalism. I think that discarding the residual rationalism which we inherit from the Enlightenment is advisable for many reasons, 
Some of these are theoretical and of interest only to philosophy professors, such as the apparent incompatibility of the correspondence theory of truth with a naturalistic account of the origin of human minds. Others are more practical. One practical reason is that getting rid of rationalistic rhetoric would permit the West to approach the non-West in the role of someone with an instructive story to tell, rather than in the role of someone purporting to make better use of a universal human capacity. Maybe this uh, just betrays uh, my not getting around in this literature enough, but uh, I'm struck by your use of loyalty, not a, not a concept one hears much about in the literature of um, moral philosophy, uh, I think. Uh, it, it used to be one uh, that was bandied about quite a bit, and uh, in particular, Josiah Royce wrote uh, his moral philosophy, uh, probably the best statement of it, the, the, the ultimate statement of it, uh, in a book called Loyalty to Loyalty, uh, in which, uh, I mean, it was very, he, he meant it to be a Hegelian book, but I think he was making a point uh, in the vicinity of the one you were making, that is, he thought he could do all the work that people needed notions like the good, the right, and the just do. Uh, he can make the notion of loyalty do all that work. Uh, instead of talking about expanding uh, the size of the group to which we were loyal, he wanted, in a sort of Kantian way, to jump all the way to the largest, uh, to the largest level uh, by going mad and saying, all right, loyalty to loyalty. I mean, this is a caricature, but maybe not a useless one. The idea was uh, that anybody who could be loyal to anything was somebody that we were loyal to. That, that, that was how we were going to get to the most inclusive, uh, to the most inclusive group. Uh, but he starts off uh, in something like the same way you do. Look, isn't it something like this sense of loyalty? Where are uh, the things? that we're pleased to call moral intuitions in the last part of our life starts. Now let's think about why that's so important to us, what do we mean by that, and so on. Uh, aren't we seeing our best selves there? Well then, anybody who is moved by this has a best self, and uh, we're implicitly in seeing our loyalties as the, the defining thing about us. We're somehow implicitly already uh, loyal to loyalty and so to this larger community. Uh, that's not Habermas's way of jumping to the most inclusive community. Is it a, a big media to see this community? Um, Sorry? Is it, is it a via media between uh, you and Habermas? That is, you, you see a gradualist, uh, let's be more inclusive, let's expand our loyalties to the extent that it's feasible and it's always going to be a question of what is feasible. Uh, Habermas wants us to, to jump right to uh, the community of everybody who can talk uh, and thinks that we're implicitly already somehow committed to, to treating that as the relevant boundary and, and the others as merely, uh, merely parochial. Uh, Roy, Royce's idea was to start with loyalty to start with a big notion um, by turning the crank again, loyalty to loyalty, to get the thin notion that gets us basically the same place. I don't know that we'll get all the animals in there, but how much does not get animals and trees in there either? And you're going to be this kind of thing, like it's only the talkers that are, that are going to matter. But at least you get all of that, even if they're funny and non human looking. You know, the Martians or the computers if they if they manage it. It's not obvious to me that the Roycean way falls prey to all of the disadvantages that you've diagnosed in Habermas. Uh, do you think there's any go in it at all? I, I guess I think that I, I look 
back at that loyalty to loyalty stuff and Royce when I was writing this paper, hoping to, you know, borrow something, steal something. Uh, but I just couldn't find much. I mean, it seemed to me that in his very broad sense of loyalty, um, what he meant by finding someone who exhibited loyalty was finding someone whom Scanlon would describe as wanting, you know, wanting to, what's uh, the phrase, justify their views to somebody, not, you know, not everybody, but somebody. And this is sort of coextensive with using language. I mean, if you don't want to justify your views to anybody, you hard, hardly be said to use language not taking part in what you call the game of giving and asking for reasons. And that, in turn, is uh, Habermas's, uh, you know, subjecting oneself to Habermas's so-called transcendental presuppositions of communication. So it seems to me, you know, there is a sort of least common denominator of uh, Royce, Scanlon, and Habermas, but I don't know what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, and, um, I don't see how it's going to function as a fulcrum to get you to enlarge your own loyalties. And you know, you can get paradigmatically loyal types who can justify, you know, undertake to justify until they're blue in the face, who most of us regard as fanatic terrorists and, you know, don't see any particular handle to use to get them out of being fanatic terrorists. So, um, you know, they're language users, they got loyalty, they got the desire to justify, you know, they got the whole thing, but they're hopeless. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I, I think of Roy Scanlon and Habermas as pretty much all in the same line of business and none of them is getting very far. And to come back to this stuff about, you know, lots of little things weaving together a polychrome quilt with a thousand stitches and so on, this is just a way of saying, you know, historically that's how it happened. <laughs> uh, it would have been nice if there had been a shortcut consisting in appeals to loyalty as such or language use as such or justification as such, but, you know, there wasn't, so they, they took the long way around. Well, or one might say, we did have one shot at the short route, and it was the French Revolution. And we basically, though we got a lot of good uh, rhetoric out of it, had to back off and start over again. Yeah. Because it turned out it didn't work if you did it. Uh, you couldn't yeah. do it at one stroke. You, you, you might say it didn't work in France very well for a while, but it changed the European self-image in a way that paid off in the course of the 19th century. That, you know, the mere possibility of the event of the French Revolution made it possible for the Europeans and the Americans to think of who, to have a, a different center of narrative gravity, you know, as, as Dennett says. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't exactly a shortcut in the way of finding a, a quick and dirty argument. It was a shortcut by way of opening up an imaginative possibility that hadn't really been live before the revolution actually cut off some heads. And, um, and Bjorn? In the uh, contingency argument in solidarity, you talk about the rationality, irrationality, distinction, and uh, recommend that we can find it to the inside of a language game. And, um, I, I see what you're saying here as a great improvement on the treatment you gave there. I wondered if, if you, if you yourself see it as saying, as construing the, the matter differently, or, or is it yeah, yeah. Putnam properly criticized that stuff in contingency, irony, and solidarity as pretending that somehow language games contain something like algorithms and you know he was right that was you know that was a misleading suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to make a version of my, my usual moves. I'm a nervous take. <laughs> um, you, you said at one point uh, a 
against Habermas, uh, the idea of the better argument, makes sense only, only in a transcultural, only if we had a transcultural context, and, and, and we don't, so it doesn't. Um, I, I think that's right about the idea of the better argument as Habermas wants to use it, but um, you know, in my usual way, I think it's sort of defeatist move to give up on the idea of the better argument um, because Habermas um, and screwed it up in that way. Um, I don't see why we shouldn't um, uh, you know, keep for our own purposes an idea of the better argument, but uh, about which it's no more true to say that it makes sense only, would make sense only if we had a transcultural uh, context for evaluating arguments. Yeah. Um, that it would be to say the parallel thing about um, the kind of should that comes out of your mouth when you say, you know, those there, um, non-liberal societies should get rid of yeah. and uh, start educating women and, you know, like, there's an evaluation and, and, and uh, you know, you just make it. Uh, um, yeah. uh, you, don't, you, you, you make it with its reach, as you put it at one point, um, yeah. extending outside the um, 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 ethnic or whatever it is group out of, out of which you speak. Um, the better argument. You know, it's, it's, it's at our disposal uh, in that kind of way. Um, this uh, connects back to uh, something that you said about the idea of um, the principles of practical reason, uh, as that idea shows up in, in, in roles. Um, you had a bit where, I can't find it. Um, yeah, page 17. Um, Surely, frankly, um, Rawls makes it perfectly plain that by the principle of practical reason, it doesn't mean some transcultural um, uh, uh, tribunal of reason, uh, the sort of thing that the Perry um, neo Kantians, the Frank Frankfurt guys, want. I mean, Rawls has no trouble with that idea. And you concluded at that point very quickly. Um, so we have to construe this phrase, the principles and conceptions of practical reason. Uh, as referring to whatever principles and conceptions are in fact arrived at in the course of creating a community. Um, and then further on, in the same spirit, practical reason of the laws as a matter of procedure rather than of substance. Um, I mean, it seems to me it needn't be so. Uh, um, and and uh, it's kind of dangerous to go that way. It makes it sound as if um, the, the position is not ethnocentric, but, but really relativist. I mean, you've got a nice distinction mm. there. I mean, as if, um, if some other bunch of, of, of people um, create a community and come up with some, you know, to us, monstrous collection of what they say are principles of practical reason, um, but that's what they come up with in the course of creating a community. And as if you're stuck with saying, so the label, the principles and conceptions of practical reason, fits uh, um, you know, that bunch of stuff insofar as it conforms to the procedural uh, uh, characterization that you did, just as well as it fits uh, Rawls's um, late 20th century Western liberal uh, uh, substantive conception of, of um, the principle. I, mean, I think it, it Rawls can have it that the principles of justice and the principles of practical reason pretty much coincide. You know, I mean, it's the same sort of gesture. Um, mm. These are the principles of practical reason, I say, in the same spirit as I say, uh, you know, these are the better arguments, or in the same spirit as I say, uh, they should get slavery, they should educate their women. Mm. Uh, there, there needn't be a, um, a flopping back into, into uh, pretending to have uh, some kind of universal grounding. Maybe. I, I can't remember his use of the term that clearly, and I don't think it is very clear, really, but, you know, I, I, I was left with the impression that he would, sim he would think of something like the Confucian ethic of ancient China as an example of practical reason, uh, even though, let's say, no Confucian ever dreamed of teaching women how to read and write. Um, but... Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I agree with you about the force of the better argument if one is, I mean, I think what's touchy here is um, when you say things like, 
you know, we're gebilded that they aren't. Uh, we were properly brought up, they aren't. Um, it's, uh, it's something we all believe, God knows. It's just that um, most philosophers think it their professional duty never to use the phrase. Um, and, you know, it's a touchy point in the interpretation of Plato, but, you know, I, I have usually thought of Plato reading, the, reading an early draft of the Nicomachean Ethics and saying, you know, you know, geez, this kid didn't get the idea. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, you know, you know, how we, you know, uh, th there's this story about Winston Churchill who went to Sandringham, the mil military, not Sandringham, whatever it was, the military academy they have in Britain. Uh, so he didn't get the usual classical education. And somebody, when he was in his 40s, somebody said, you know, Winston, you never read Aristotle? Nope, never read Aristotle. So they gave him a copy of the Nicomachean and Ethics. And some weeks later, Churchill gave it back, and his friend said, how'd you like it? And he said, well, you know, I read some of it, but, you know, that was the way I was brought up. You know, uh, you know, why do I need to read this? <laughs> uh, and, I mean, it, you know, there did seem to me that tone in... in the ethics of, you know, people who are brought up, you know, will know what I'm talking about, and people who aren't well brought up won't. And, you know, this is the way outside of the philosophy classroom we proceed in everyday life. It's just when we drag it into the classroom, it sounds out of place. And that's why, that's why I have a feeling you're just not going to get away with building. It's, uh, you know, once people, you know, the, you know, the, the phrase in, in your book, Mind and World, that is going to be least popular is properly brought up. I mean, that's, that's the one that'll kill the book, if anything does. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it, it has this great intuitive appeal that the comic and ethics also has, but Plato somehow set the rules where you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what's the I think of what he's doing now in the response as a kind of a ethnocentric ascent, uh, shifting up the level of what you call ethnocentrism to, to, to a level where you need feel no scruples about saying um, things like uh, the better argument should be in. So it, it may be that uh, the, the fear of rhetorical consequences of talking that way that, that you have um, would be alleviated once you start looking carefully at the kinds of claims that somebody would make once they are a mature historicist relying on Sellers and Davidson and you and, and proceeding to make this kind of ethnocentric descent, the kinds of claims they would use to back up those kinds of diagnostic remarks. How it is they would sit about on or the purposes to which they would put them. So I took the point that you wanted to make in CIS with the rationality, rationality distinction is look the point you make here when you say you pay yourself an empty compliment when you say, well, uh, I may not have convinced the other guy, but at least I was being rational. Um, and and that, that kind of use would fall away for someone that's performed ethnocentric consent. And so those kinds of worrying uh, pseudo legitimations, that aspect of the use will disappear once you really take to heart the, 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 the historicistic, the Savarts and Davidsonian account of what we're doing when we use the term. And, and so that it's not just a matter of deciding whether or not to use the words, but how we implement them and, and what, what, what the exchange rules become once we start seeing them in this way. Yeah, the, the how rather than the what, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, I've had an experience and then parrot a little bit of John McDowell's uh, rhetorics and saying something like, uh, there's maybe one more thing you would like to, to uh, use uh, from reason, I mean, that, that's on a basic level, I mean, if we're going to Boston and have to convince all these people that they have to live in peace, um, it seems like 
on a basic level uh, to demand reason from, from people about what they're doing, justification in a basic level. I mean, that shouldn't, uh, uh, that shouldn't be thrown out with our content of the big reason either. I'm, I'm not getting the point. I mean, my, I, I do not manage this rhetoric of John Nadal that well. Um, uh, it's to say that within a pragmatic view, uh, you shouldn't want to, to throw out that part of reason, which is simply uh, on a basic level that you ask people to give reasons, to give justification for what they're doing. I mean, as a theoretic, that you didn't want to throw out either, no? Well, no, certainly not, but um, yeah, I, I'm nervous about your putting it as throwing out that part of reason. I mean, it seems to me all that John and I are arguing about is which bits of rhetoric to keep and which to throw away. It isn't that, you know, reason has parts and you keep some and you keep others. You know. uh, I mean, I guess I think that there aren't any rules for dealing with really weird different cultures or fanatical terrorists or Nazis or you know whatnot you use whatever handle you can get and often find you don't have any handle at all so there's not much point in trying you know to trying to predict what what you will and won't do with them um, I mean yeah you'll ask them for justification and you know if they give you you know an appeal to the orders of the supreme leader or something you know you're stuck. Uh, I think that most of the issues revolve around what rhetoric you can get philosophy professors to buy, uh, you know, what, uh, what kind of reflective equilibrium you can get among the contemporary learned of the West, and um, you know, it's, I mean, what the the word that has been found most offensive in everything I've ever written is ethnocentrism. Uh, the word that uh, Habermas finds most offensive in Gadamer's Bildung, I suspect that properly brought up will be the word they find most offensive in McDowell. Uh, you know, there's a curse on these notions, and uh, you know, you you want you want to get them in, but you got to find some really smooth way to do it. Yeah. Um, you've given us some idea of your vision of a utopia by saying all inclusive, educational women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, would you say a few words about violence? Is that ever justified? Sure, all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what. That's why we have policemen. <laughs> the state has a monopoly of violence. Uh, they should have guns. Nobody else should have guns. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, you, you would think it was okay. To achieve your utopia, to, to use violence. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Lots of violence. Yeah. Yeah. I was all in favor of the Second World War. A very violent war. <laughs> that makes a difference. Or just to employ the principle of William James. That's something which makes a difference. Violence. Yeah. 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 Uh, how do you respond to the frequent criticism on here? Sure. How do you respond to the frequent criticism I hear of the modern liberal democracy? Um, the freedoms, the leisure, and conveniences which allow us to make these kinds of issues. That all this depends on uh, a form of neo-colonialism. I hear this a lot from my students in Galicia. They have a very strong sense of being colonized by Spain and whatnot. But uh, how would you respond to that, saying that I guess, well, you talked about it at the beginning of your, of your essay, but uh, you think these freedoms we gain really are, when the day is over, um, more important than accountability to the global implications of the economic system. Well, like I say, I wish I knew. I, you know, I, I mean, my hunch is that you know, Periclean Athens and the West of the last 150 years are possible only 
as a result of hitherto undreamt of affluence. I mean, if it hadn't been for Athenian imperialism, the silver mines at Larium, all that stuff, if it hadn't been for the gold of the New World and you know things like that, uh, you wouldn't have had uh, most of what we think is important about the West, either morally, artistically, any other way. Uh, Dewey's generation thought that um, the kind of affluence that made Athens and the modern West possible was going to be available to the human race by virtue of technology. You know, he thought that, you know, given enough technology, uh, everybody could lead bourgeois lives. Uh, he could still be right, it just looks more implausible than it did in his time. But, you know, if they develop quick fusion, cheap, cheap fusion energy and a few other things, you know, who knows? Uh, but I have no better ideas. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously it takes enormous affluence. I don't think that that shows that there's something deeply corrupt about Pericles in Athens, the modern West, or something like that. I think it just shows you what human beings can do when they have a lot of money. They become much more virtuous. <laughs> You know, they get much nicer, <laughs> uh, much better sorts of people when they have money. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how to combine, I mean, this is the thing I sketched in the second page of the paper, you know, how are you going to combine the degree of affluence necessary to have human decency with the degree of equality that human decency requires, I don't know. <laughs> don't you think perpetuation of these differences will, I mean, not only be disastrous for the rest of the world, but lead to the implosion of the Western democracies themselves? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, that's, that kind of question was already being posed at the beginning of this century, and nobody would conceivably have predicted the various things that have happened in this century, so I'm not about to start predicting what's going to happen in the next one. Um, Just uh, an afterword. Thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, for this wonderful pack that is yeah. Th Thank you very much for asking me. I'm very grateful to all of you for having had the patience to sit through all this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.